this presentation of this morning is by Professor Fabrice Amjot Durand. Oh, no, that's the wrong He's one. professor of bioethics and medical humanities, and he serves as director of the graduate program in bioethics at the Medical College of Wisconsin, USA. And in, the, in addition, his second affiliation is as resident philosopher at the MCW Kern Institute, where he directs the Philosophies of Medical Education Transformation Laboratory. In addition, he holds an appointment as senior researcher at the Institute for Biomedical Ethics at the University of Basel, Switzerland. His scholarship and research interests focus on issues including neuroethics, ethical issues in psychiatry, and mental health, the use of new technologies in psychiatry, and human identity, the philosophy of medicine and medical professionalism in bioethics, and moral or political philosophy. He received his PhD from Rice University and a master in bioethics from McGill University. And his presentation will be about the technology way of being and human flourishing in health care, antithesis, or, th or synthesis. So we're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you for your kind introduction, and thank you for sticking with me. Uh, I know it has been uh, a wonderful event, but it's, yeah, we need to, it's like a marathon. So uh, I think what I'd, I'd like to do uh, today is, um, in some ways, take a different uh, approach to these questions. As Tenzin said yesterday, uh, with Marcello or Yenka, we did a lot of research. We even edited a book on uh, assisted uh, technologies for dementia care. Um, and, but then I moved beyond that because it seems to me that there is a fundamental question that I don't think we had addressed very um, carefully. And of course, it's, it's a question of time. But what is the impact of these technologies on physicians, on or clinicians, on patients, on the way we understand ourselves? Um, as human beings. And this is a broader discussion about how we embrace technology in our culture. So when uh, Solke invited me, this is, and I'm quoting her here in the letter, but it's to explore visions of near and future technology developments and reflect on the social technological challenges these may pose and which technolo uh, technical and scientific or uh, scientific condition may become necessary. So we'll see if I'm, uh, so I was kind of interested, but I had to really think about how I want to frame these issues. So we'll see if I will be successful. And as I mentioned, I really want to, uh, in this presentation, really think about, yeah, technology is wonderful. I'm not opposed to technology. We use technology, we have people from all over the, the, the world, they're in Australia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is great. In the medical context, it's also wonderful. So in that sense, yes. But I think we need to think carefully how we move forward in uh, the way we embrace this technology. So what I'm going to do is really talk about uh, some facts about um, uh, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And I, I do that because I want to keep in mind that, yes, we have a huge problem. And technology, all kinds of technology, might be a way to fix it. But again, um, and I want to keep that in mind as I go through these uh, these slides. And then this is the point I, I was trying to make: is really these uh, anthropological uh, considerations uh, in terms of the impact these technologies have on us as human beings. And then this idea of I want to talk a little bit about technologism in medicine. Because, and um, as in the introduction it was mentioned, so I have an appointment um, in bioethics, but I'll, I do also spend half my time at the Kern Institute. And what we try to do at, this, uh, at the Institute is really to think about, so it's called the Kern Institute for the Transformation of Medical Education. And what we see is that in medicine, uh, especially I would say in the Anglo Saxon world, we embrace technology. You know, it's, it's always, the solution is about technology. Um, I published lately a book on the debate about moral bioenhancement. So we have issues, technology will be the, the, the solution. We need to fix the brain of uh, people, so they're gonna behave, et cetera, et cetera. It's this mindset. 
And what you see in medicine is also the, the same. And, and, and so if you, if you have robots replacing physicians and step by step going that direction, I think we are dehumanizing healthcare, medicine, the way we treat patients, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have to be careful and not to have this kind of pragmatic utilitarian approach in medicine and say, well, we have a shortage of nurses. Technology will be the answer because we have to think about how this will impact patients, right? Uh, the elderly, we are in a culture, if you talk uh, in Asian cultures or different cultures, or maybe in Israel, uh, where you put the, the focus on the family. You know, it used to be the case, or even now, there are uh, Indians, for instance, uh, I think in the Indian culture, they will take care of their parents. And what we do, we send them to a the, uh, nursing home, and you have technology, and then play with games, uh, or, you know, keep your mind, instead of saying, well, we need to, oops, is it good? Just continue. Okay, I'll continue. And we, we press our yeah. fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, now it's doing something on my computer. Here. Okay, now it's good. Um, sorry, you don't see what's happening there. Okay, I'll continue. And then I want to talk uh, about a framework. I call it, I don't want to call it ethical framework, we'll see, but then I'm going to have a uh, complete remark. But just uh, as a reminder, uh, AD or, you know, uh, well, I'm going to, Alzheimer's disease or dementia is one of the most dreaded diseases of people 55 years old and over. And then if you look at the prevalence of, uh, again, Alzheimer's disease or dementia, worldwide it's more or less 44 million people. And in the U.S. it's uh, 5, 4 uh, point million people with AD in 2016. I don't know the data here in uh, in Germany, but if you think about uh, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, aging population, the numbers will uh, will go up. By 2050, we're going to be at almost 40 million people. Um, so in the United States, if you look at the financial burden uh, in the U.S. Uh, by 2050, 1.1 trillion dollars. Potential, potential cost of uh, addressing uh, or taking care of patients with dementia. And if you look at, uh, there was a report written by the Alzheimer's Disease International and then the World Health Organization, they talk about, uh, they, they wrote a report and they write that, uh, I mean, the, the goal of the, the report is to raise awareness of dementia as a public health priority worldwide. And this is really to recognize that it is a real problem. And technology can be a solution, but not the solution only. And again, for the reason I mentioned uh, previously. When we look at uh, predict, uh, predictability, uh, now we have technology that will allow us to uh, really uh, diagnose uh, early onset of Alzheimer's disease, uh, nearly 100%. So the question is, okay, we have diagnosis, what do we do? There is a burden on patients, right? Do you want to know? Do you want to know that potentially you are, uh, you could develop Alzheimer's disease? Well, it's a, it, 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 it's a burden, right? Uh, in a sense, you could say yes, because then I can do some changes in terms of lifestyle, and, and now there's evidence that some uh, the way you eat, what you eat, uh, exercise, stress, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can affect uh, your brain. Um, so the bad news is that we don't have any effective treatment. And uh, as I will show you, I don't know here in, in, in Germany, but there's a shift. Um, so. Uh, Psychopharmacology is not working. Uh, it's very clear it's about managing symptoms uh, related to cognitive capacities. But in 2018, Pfizer, and here I'm going to turn here because it's so small on my screen, but uh, so this was in uh, 2018, said it would stop trying to discover new drugs for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, abandoning costly but futile efforts to find effective treatment for the disorder. 
So even uh, pharmaceutical companies, they're like, well, mm -hmm. we tried, we invested so much money, uh, and uh, there is no treatment. Uh, now, I don't know if you heard about this, and this was an article that uh, just came out. Uh, it's not a scientific article, but it was in the news. But now uh, they're taking new directions, and they're trying to see if there is a uh, correlation or a link between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, again, there's a shift here. And then, of course, we have, uh, there's a, a little video here, I'm not gonna uh, go through the video, but you see basically the interaction, and this is what we discussed so far, in terms of robots and, and or a patient with Alzheimer's disease uh, interacting with a robot, and then, uh, so, you know, I'm not opposed to that. I think this is wonderful, because the robots say, hey, what did you eat today? Did you turn uh, off the lights? Uh, did you do this, this, this? So th this is wonderful. And then, uh, even a little bit more radical, <coughs> is the idea of creating an artificial hippocampus, right? It's a brain implant. And this was, again, 2018. So the idea is really to um, implant the brain, uh, in the brain, a, um, a chip that will replace um, the hippocampus. Uh, so what we see is that neurotechnologies will have a new role in addressing this question. So uh, you might have, uh, you know, you could use uh, deep brain stimulation uh, to slow down the course of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so there is some evidence, there was a study in 2012 uh, that examined the effect of deep brain stimulation uh, on the uh, entorhinal cortex, which is the gateway uh, to the hippocampus involved in memory and learning on seven subjects. And uh, this subject, uh, I mean, they use uh, psychopharmacology, didn't work, but by stimulating the brain, they saw that there was a, a kind of uh, improvement. So uh, here you could, you know, by deep brain stimulation, you can slow down the course of AD. Um, on the other hand, um, you could have neuroprosthetics, such as I mentioned, artificial hippocampus. And here is the idea to replace or compensate for lost cognitive capacity. And here, there were also uh, there was a study in 2017 uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. They developed a technique to compensate the failing of the hippocampus through electric uh, stimulation. What it, what is interesting about the results is that. Um, when uh, memory was effective and you stimulate the, the patient, uh, the outcome was worse. So you have to adapt. Uh, and and so, um, so I find it interesting to, to read that. And then what are uh, the, challenges, the challenges in caring for these patients? So you see that there's decreased ability to perform complex tasks, and, and we discussed that, but reduced memory of personal history, changes in personal identity, changes in behavior, uh, cognitive decline, inability to interact with the environment, and total dependence at the end stage. But what I find interesting, and I think this is why uh, I'm not sure technology might be always the solution, is uh, if you look at the impact of the self of these patients, um, they, they, uh, there, there are some interviews and, and these patients say, well, the self is disintegrating. I feel like I cannot find myself. So you see the change of personality. I'm no longer me, right? And so the question is, how do we support that? Will technology allow um, uh, us to care about these individuals and uh, in some ways protect their sense of self. And I think this is what uh, worries me a little bit about how we interact with technology or the role of technology and how technology can help us uh, construct or protect a sense of self. So here you have, you, you have basically two narratives. One is to say, let's not worry about the past. We're gonna care about these individuals and uh, their sense of self is basically today and the future. The past doesn't matter because it's going to be very difficult uh, to, um, to go back to the past for these individuals. Um, but I think it's problematic. Or we can say 
we have an obligation to support these individuals and making sure that we can make the connection, we help these individuals to make the connection between the past and the present, and, and we support their sense of self. So here I have a quote by uh, Lee Beard uh, in 2015. Dementia is troubling because at the same time as it erodes someone's memory, it also eats away at the capacity to create shared meaning. And here we see that shared meaning is really about how we interact uh, as human beings. If someone cannot remember not just where the milk bottle goes, but what a milk bottle is, then the shared presupposition on which communication, meaning, and identity depend become badly stained. So it seems to me that if we want to protect uh, the humanity of the patient, question of meaning, communication, identity are key to these questions. So I really emphasize this dimension because, uh, and of course you can step outside uh, medicine and go into the social context, but I think uh, it would be the same kind of discussion and we, we can uh, discuss whether, you know, is it too, I'm, I'm focusing too much on medicine and whether maybe from a, on a social level the discussion would be different. So as we, we look forward, um, the trend I see not only in the discussion we have here at this symposium, but in general about technology and emerging technologies is that we try to find technological solutions to address clinical, social, political, and existential issues. And this is very clear on debates. Uh, I mean, here it's, it's about the clinical context, but even social, political uh, dimensions. If you look at um, the debate about mobile enhancement, it's exactly the same discourse. Say, oh, people cannot behave, as I mentioned previously. We're going to try to find a technology that will allow individuals um, to quote unquote behave, uh, and then existential issues. And this is the whole debate. I don't know who is familiar with the debate about with Julian Savulescu and others on, on human enhancement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it seems to me that uh, because of this, what I just mentioned previously, this idea that uh, we we try to find technological solution to address these questions. I think there is an increased need to protect our humanity, especially in the clinical context. Uh, the, the shortage of nurses and even physicians, or the, the high burnout among physicians, more distress, uh, nurses leading the, the profession. My daughter is a nurse, and uh, she's not in, in you know, taking care of Alzheimer's disease, but she's in oncology, and she said it's, uh, it's awful the burden we put on, on uh, our uh, clinicians, so we need to rethink that. So now, that being said, and this is where, uh, uh, bear with me because uh, this is going to be a bit more philosophical in the sense that, from my perspective, um, I think in Western culture, we have what I call an anthropological identity crisis. Uh, in the sense that, again, it goes back to these questions of, if I would ask you, what is a human being? It used to be the case, because of Western culture, we had this sense of, well, human being is X. Today is much more complicated, for various reasons. One of them is uh, because of the use of technology. And then if you, and here I apologize, but I'm, I'm gonna, mentioned two French uh, authors, um, and I don't know how many of you uh, will uh, read French, but there is a, a, an interesting book by Jérôme Fourquet, L'Archipel Français, and it's an ana analysis of the, the, the French, French culture. But he's talking about uh, a major civilizational and anthropological shift. And if you read in French, he, uh, Les symptômes d'un basculement civilisationnel et anthropologique majeur. And what he did in relation to French culture, he saw a, 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 a shift in how we understand ourselves, how we relate to our own body. Um, and then there is a, a, a removal of the hierarchy. 
between humans and animals. And then you have all these practices. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. I don't know how many of you have tattoos. I don't have a tattoo. But now if you don't have a tattoo, you're the minority, at least in the United States. Everybody has a tattoo. So it's it, and then we can do all these changes, you know, uh, plastic surgery and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have a different way of how we understand ourselves um, uh, in terms of what the body is. And this is a claim also. There's another. Uh, uh, she's a philosopher. Uh, Fouquet, I think, is a political analyst. Uh, she wrote a small booklet on, in French, the title, I mean, the translation would be the disembodied human being from the carnal body to the fabricated body. My translation, I don't know if this is the, the right translation, but basically she makes three points. And again, um, the idea that uh, we can transcend the biological limits of our body and brains using technology. And then, again, this idea of how we relate to our own body. Are we our body or do we have a body? And the body becomes a, an entity that we can manipulate as well. And then uh, human beings are, uh, becomes creators. Now, if you push the reasoning, this is what we're trying to do with um, you know, artificial intelligence and autonomous robots and, and that type of technology. In, uh, in my own work, uh, I mentioned this book uh, here that I just published this year, uh, but where I address this question of what does it mean to be human and how should we interact with technology? What is the impact of technology on us? And then uh, Carter Sneed is a lawyer and uh, I think the title is very explicit, what it means to be human, the case for the body in public bioethics. And what you see in, in, in our culture is this kind of Gnosticism, uh, going back to Greek philosophy, where the body is, as I mentioned, something that doesn't give us a, a sense of an identity. Uh, it's more about what I think about myself. Uh, now, a lot of discussion about that. I don't want to uh, go into that trap for, for, for today. But what I'm saying is that we treat each <coughs> other embodiment in a different way. So, but what I find interesting, already in the 60s or 50s with uh, Heidegger, but already uh, in uh, Max Scheller, uh, Man's Place in Nature, already in, this, in the 60s raised this issue that the study of man, I mean the study of human beings, is problematic. Already then he saw that uh, these anthropological questions uh, were problematic, uh, and he saw a disconnect between the scientific way of thinking about anthropology, the philosophical way, and the, the theological way. And here you see a, um, a quote by him. So, and then you have Martin Heidegger, uh, and this is where I think I, I like his work. Uh, because uh, in the 50s when he wrote the, uh, well, the, the question concerning technology and I think in, in Germany is die Frage nach der Technik. Is it good German? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm pra practicing my German. So anyway, uh, but in, in, in the 50s, but what he saw is that, you know, technology, we use technology to a particular, uh, as a means to an end. But if you read that essay, which is very complex, it takes time to, to really uh, understand what is, uh, and I'm going to try to, to explain. But basically now, what he saw is technology is defining us. And in some ways, technology, he was questioning whether technology is, in some ways, undermining our own human essence. Okay, bear with me. Here are two quotes by Heidegger. What threatens man or human beings is his very nature, but in his very nature is the view that man, by the peaceful release, transformation, storage, and channeling of the energies of physical nature, could render the human condition tolerable for everybody and happy in all respect. So he's questioning whether 
I mean, physical nature here is talking about technology. And the greatest danger is that the approaching tide of technological revolution in the atomic age could so captivate the witch, dazzle, and the wild man that calculative thinking may someday come to be accepted and practiced as the only way of thinking. What is he saying here? What he's, he's saying is that science or techno science become the theory of the real. It provides the elements to understand the nature, constitution, and structure of reality. And so then he develops the idea of uh, gestell or in framing. It's the mode of revealing and ordering reality by modern technology. So the narrative, how we understand the world, is always mediated through technology. But what about if you say, well, so you saw me yesterday and we had this conversation about, you know, uh, about your project and I was questioning a little bit, but do we understand morality through technology, through science? Or is there something else that will provide some insights about the nature of morality? What he's saying is suddenly, and I see that in, 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 in debates about uh, the nature of morality. You know, you have in, in neurotics, you have this debate between, uh, or the, the kind of approach, it's the ethics of neuroscience and the neuroscience of ethics. The neuroscience of ethics is how do we understand what's happening in the brain when we make more choices. So you could have a very reductive approach and say, well, morality is just based on evolution, what's happening in the brain. But then you have uh, philosophers questioning that and say, well, uh, Charles Taylor and Matthew are saying, well, wait a minute here, maybe some notion of the good is something that is outside ourselves, something that either we discover or we create and we think, and, and it's not just based on biological processes and then uh, in some ways manipulated through technology. So, uh, um, what I find interesting, and here again a quote by uh, Heidegger, he said, the essence of technology is by no means anything technological. So when we try to understand the nature of technology, it's not that technology, it's not about uh, technology itself, but rather how technology creates this metaphysical, this worldview. And um, so I, I think I made these two points, but let me, uh, the, the first one, the second one, is, so the question is not about harm, is not about how technology could harm us. Yes, it's part of the discussion, but it's more about, and this is really the point I will make uh, in this talk, is about how technology is reordering how we understand ourselves uh, in two ways, or challenges the ontological status of human beings in two ways in terms of human agency and the telos of human existence. Will our the human future be technological? Um, if you think about the, uh, the transhumanists, what they want to do is really to push the envelope and then if we could, we could upload human consciousness and then we would have a bionic body and then, and then I don't know what could happen, but in, in that sense, in terms of the telos, the end of the future of the uh, human existence. And then uh, the second point is about the objectification of human beings. So in terms of uh, human agency, so this idea, this concept of uh, gestell or the frame creates, sorry for the typo, the space where people can listen to what they're revealing is divulging. So technology is revealing something about the world. But the world is also, we are part of this world. But it's this continuous revealing of new possibilities. Think about uh, how biotechnology provides those uh, opportunities. Uh, think about how technology reconceptualizes our notion of morality. 
in terms also in terms of mental and cognitive uh, abilities. This is all about this notion of human enhancement. So uh, we see that there's this constant reordering of reality and it undermines human agency, reshaping the telos of human existence. Oh, I thought this was human existence. Now we have new possibilities. I could do this, I could do this. this. And it's this constant reshaping, this constant uh, revealing that is in some ways uh, undermines, uh, well, the telos of uh, human uh, of the, the future uh, of the human species. Now you could say, well, maybe it's a good thing. And with Mark, we had a discussion like that uh, last night about, you know, uh, where we go in terms of, is it a good thing? I mean, we, maybe it's it's part of the human evolution, and, and you know, we we need to think about. It. Yes, it is. But if if that process and reminds us, if ultimately we're gonna be destroyed by technology, is it worth it? And then the second point is about the objectification of human beings. So human beings, since we are, we are, um, I mean, we use technology, but technology is also used against us, against or toward us, depending on where you, 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 um, you, you stand on the, on the issue. But you mean, so uh, Heidegger talks about this, uh, this notion of standing reserve. So it means the modern way technology reveals the world, um, uh, us included, is a place of infinite, infinite resources. Uh, the body is an object uh, um, that should be manipulated. We could, um, in some ways, harvest. Um, uh, all kinds of things in the human body. So it's an object that we, we, we can, as I said, manipulate. If you think about um, how a patient is reduced to a body, a body to an organ, and then where's the, the subject in that process? Even if you talk to surgeons, they say, well, you know, you operate, but you have to think you have a patient here. It's not just an organ, or it's not just the body part that you're manipulating, now you're manipulating the patient. And then this is where the, uh, this notion of you know, the humanity of the patient is so, so important. And then if we are uh, subject to that manipulation, then the question is, where is the subject in all of that? And if these technology, assistive technologies, are reducing, uh, and I'm not saying this is what we discussed, but we have to be careful. If we are reducing the patient to an object of manipulation and control using, you know, robots, etc., or even chips, then this is where I think we are objectifying uh, human beings and we are reducing human, human beings to, to an object of manipulation. Um, so, um, how much time do I have? Because I don't know when we started. Uh, about 10 minutes. Is it until 10.30? Yeah. And then do we have time to, for questions, or do we, move, we go straight to the other uh, part? Well, we have the well, we can discuss. OK. So I'm going to go quick. Uh, let me maybe skip this. Um, we talk about this, this leveling effect of technology. So this is where. Um, um, and this is a quote by myself, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. But, and again, this is a discussion we had last night about how technology, in some ways, there is a, a complexity with technology, but there is a uniformity that is also part of the process, right? We all communicate with iPhones instead of writing a letter or et cetera, et cetera. And you see this leveling effect of technology, and I think it's problematic. Uh, in my view, because you need to protect the identity of each individual in the healthcare context, and especially uh, based on what I was saying about how the disease affects uh, a sense of self of a patient with Alzheimer's disease or, or dementia. 
So I think here it's this tension between the biological and the technological, and in how technology affects our sense of identity, of uniqueness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in my view, and, and these are, um, you know, in purpose, I went back to to, uh, to Heidegger, to Gadamer, and uh, Edwin Pellegrin was a physician and a philosopher in his own right. But they're talking about, you know, uh, Heidegger said, um, you know, we should be careful and not abandon the field of medicine to scientific technicians. Uh, Gadamer talks about the loss of personhood, which happens within medical science when the individual patient is objectified in terms of a mere multiplicity of data. These days, and he wrote this in 96, these days we're collecting a lot of data. Then you reduce a patient to, to, to a bunch of data and then you forget that there is a patient. If, for instance, you have machine learning, making diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera, and, and then if this would be automated, and we're not there yet, or we're not there, I don't know if we're gonna be there, uh, but I think we need to anticipate that. And then uh, Edwin Pellegrino talks about the technological anxiety of medicine. You know, more technology is better, necessarily. Uh, and he talks about, also about the science is susceptible to seduction of the technological imperatives. Um, again, I'm not saying that technology is bad, but this idea of uh, you know, anxiety, more technology is better, I need as a physician, I have to have the, the latest MRI, and then what do you do? Well, it's very costly, so you have patients, and then it's the, you know, more patients, more patients, etc. And then, it, 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 you know, it's a different discussion, but it has implication in how we deliver healthcare. So this is why, uh, in my work, I try to emphasize the idea that the patient is a person. So how do we shape, uh, how do we uh, have a sense of personal identity? Well, it, it requires the ability to construct, construct a sense of self in relation to others and to the surrounding world. The problem is a patient with dementia, uh, this, uh, the idea that you can, the ability to relate to the surrounding world might be shattered. Um, and so if we're gonna help these individuals, we need to help them um, uh, shape that identity or protect that identity. So, if we look at the, the exact nature of this relationship to the world and to others, if the ability to recall biographical events is impaired, it's what we need to uh, also include in our discussions. And the breakdown occurs at the two levels. The first one is at the functional level. The disorder limits the to function in the world independently. So you always have to mediate what, uh, or the patient uh, will have to mediate um, his or her experience through somebody else. But then also at the cognitive level. Um, and, and so people, the surrounding people, will have to support the identity, will have to say, uh, I was talking to someone, I don't know if it was here or somewhere else, but uh, a case where uh, basically the, uh, the son was taking care of the father and the son every morning would say, I'm your son, this is your house. And he went through all these details. Every morning he had to do that. So just to reinforce a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, as opposed to say, well, okay, you don't remember, you move on. So. Um, a way to, to, that I found, and, and I don't have time to, to really go through, uh, through this, but uh, Francoise Bélis uh, has this notion of relational narrative account of personal identity, and I find it very interesting and helpful uh, as we, we discuss uh, the care of um, a patient with uh, Alzheimer's disease, because it makes the connection between personal identity, embodiment, and meaning making. Uh, it is relational and socially oriented. It values personal embodiment and it emphasizes the inter interdependence of persons. So if you have that uh, notion of personal identity and you want to reinforce that in patients with Alzheimer's disease, it seems to me that might be a way to, it's relational, it's, uh, there's a narrative, 
and you, it reinforces uh, personal identity. Uh, I would highly recommend that you read uh, this piece. Uh, I can give you the title of uh, the paper if you want. So, uh, and here I have only a few uh, slides. I'm going to go quick. But this is why I would suggest that uh, in, in, in the work we do um, independently or, I don't know, these are suggestions. But I think we need to work on three, uh, three levels. The first one is identity integrity. It seems to me there is a more imperative in the clinical context to respect the identity of the patient. We need to be truthful to the patient and not create a false narrative if the person doesn't recall, say, oh yeah, and you know how it is when you have an elderly parent and you, it's easy to, to just say something so they feel comfortable, but you might not be truthful in your statement. And then uh, best interest principle, uh, any, new, uh, any intervention should always be in the best interest of the person you're dealing with. And then uh, we, we need to uh, individualize care, uh, recognize the, the limited scope of neuroprosthetics and assistive uh, technologies uh, like companionship uh, robots. Um, and then uh, identity is constituted in relation to others, so we need to have meaningful relationship as we take care of a patient. And then again, recognize and, and affirm the identity of, that, uh, of the patient, as opposed to simply uh, you know, try, try to create a, potentially a false narrative. And then um, you know, we need to think about the ends of therapeutic interventions. Uh, in my view, we should restore as much as possible this technology Technology should restore as much as possible the patient's state of health prior to the occurrence of the disorder. As much as possible, of course, Alzheimer's disease or dementia is, is declining. It, it's a question of decline, so um, we can discuss that. And then normalize brain functions. It would be easy if you, if you have, let's say, a uh, artificial hippocampus, you say, well, you create new capacities. And say, hey, it's going to be the super memory and you're going to do all that. I think uh, in the clinical context, uh, and, and this is the whole debate about enhancement and therapy. And then we, we need to carefully assess the benefits and burden of uh, interventions. My last slide. So, going back to this notion of flourishing and then our technological way of being. Should we bring these insights together? Can we flourish uh, as human beings? Can patients flourish with all this technology? I would say, well, it depends. But um, in my view, technology should always promote human interaction, should always respect personal identity, and should always uh, serve human ends. So, thank you. <laughs>
they think that the role of the physician is also to educate the patient. And so the I'm, physician, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in that sense, something about the caregiver. Uh, well, the, oh, in the, okay, in that sense, um, okay, I, I see the, the distinction when you said caregiver, I was thinking about the physician. So you, you mean the, the parent or the, exactly. the, the, um, the son or the, the wife? Son and, uh, yes. Uh, well, it, 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 well, at least from my perspective, I think truthfulness is the best way to avoid problems. But I don't have experience with on this question, um, but it, this is, I mean, a fun, fundamental to, to human relationships, in my view, to be truthful as much as possible. But you're, you're right, the relationship is key. And sometimes not to say something is not about lying, it's just to say, I'm not going to say everything. So, anyway. So, I have uh, actually Silke, Andreas, and Alice on my list, and then Johannes. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate um, the way and, and the fact, so to say, that you're um, starting again to raise the very basic question, I would call them, namely, what is the general, um, perhaps, let's say, anthropological and even moral presumptions that stand behind this whole attempts, whether they have high-tech or perhaps more low-tech um, um, attempts. Um, but I, I like to um, also bit, uh, raise a, a question or, or pose a counter precision regarding the main idea about the, the human uh, or our relationship to our own body in, let's say, late modernity and what is the role of technology. And then I think perhaps we, we have perhaps a very different understanding of what, what technology encaptures. So first of all, I, I totally agree and I, I, I share your concern that, let's say, in general, modern biomedicine has a tendency to promote a kind of reductionist, very biomaterialistic view on the body. I mean, there are a lot of evidence on that, I mean, from stem cell research to other types of cell therapies, uh, gene therapies, so on and so on. Um, but however, I think it's more complicated because, I mean, we live in a world where I at least appreciate um, or I respect, so to say, that there's not just one worldview anymore. And this encaptures also that there's not just one anthropolo anthropological position, but we have a kind of pluralistic approach. And I think it's interesting that somehow a counterposition to this type of biomaterialistic approach, namely the so-called social constructivist approach to the body, somehow fuels in exactly what you described on the other level, namely that people think they have the right to construct their own body as ever they individually want. And so I think this whole idea about the tattoo culture, the, the plastic surgery, I mean, uh, what art artists did, I mean, think about this French artist Arlon, for example, you might know her, I mean, who play around with how far you can go with your body, or, or Stella, who, who uses um, this kind of AI uh, body extensions for exploring uh, the limits of the human body, and by this also an enlarging the idea that embodiment can be enlarged by different types of technology or drugs or whatever. So I think it's a bit more complicated to put, so to say, the, the, the responsibility only on the biomedical community or the, the medical profession or the te technicians, but it has something to do with the general idea that there is no that the body itself is now an object, and this has two strands in, 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 in late modernity. And then the alternative, so to say, would be to make the body itself again to a subject. And, and this, of course, has a strong religious tradition, and I'm, I'm sensing a bit that this is a kind of hidden premise, perhaps partly in your philosophical approach. Um, so the idea the body is holy, you are, you are not allowed to touch it, and, and there are quite interesting debates around it. I mean, think about uh, limits to, um, in, in Jewish culture, for example, what you're allowed to stop machine at the end of life, for example. Um, 
And then this might go along with perhaps more phenomenological approaches who have a very subjective idea about how you perceive the world, the world and that the body is, so to say, your access to the world. But just having displayed um, this, I think, being respectful to patients means also to be respectful that this fuse on towards the body, there is not one one few that easily can claim to be the more convincing one, but we live in a pluralistic world. So medical profession also has to respect, at least if, you, if what you said, that you have patients who might come with different understandings of what the body is. And I was wondering how you can integrate your, your own idea to, to personalize, to individualize treatment on the one hand, but then somehow proposing, at least implicitly perhaps, that there should be one way how we see bodies or technology, and that should be more like a holistic approach. So, so <laughs> if you remember in the talk, I said this is about medicine. When mm -hmm. you go into the social context, yes, well, you can do whatever you want with your body. My worry, uh, and this is part of the work I do at the Kern Institute, is that basically society has hijacked medicine and we put a burden on physicians and say, I want you to justify what I want. Mm -hmm. As a psychiatrist, I'm pretty sure you have cases where people come to you and say, hey, I want to do X, Y, and Z. Can you just prescribe? Can you just uh, you know, write a note so I'm good to go? So for that reason, I, I think in medicine, we have this, uh, there is a tradition about how we understand the body as a you know, biological entity, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, this is where you sense, a, a sense, of, uh, you sense that I have this kind of conservative, not in a political sense, uh, but it's because medicine is inherently, uh, to a certain extent, conservative but also it's a moral practice. It's a whole debate we, <laughs> we could, but for that particular reason, I think we have to be careful. And um, if you think about plastic surgeons, but not plastic surgeon, you have a patient with uh, cancer and then breast reconstruction, this is okay. But people want to do all kinds of stuff with their body. You know, men wanting, wanting to have big calves, uh, because it looks better, I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, but you know, that type of, for me, it's, it's hubris. In light of what we see in, 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 in culture, in, in, lack of, in, in light of the needs we have in terms of healthcare, it seems to me that if you want to create, and, and there is an art, a country member who talks about schmockters and doctors. You have doctors really focusing on taking care of patients. And then you have these schmockters wanting to do all kinds of things. And then, then you're going to have all kinds of anthropologies possible and et cetera, et cetera. But as I mentioned from the get-go, I said, I want to focus on medicine. This is my interest. So valid points, but I think we need to go back to, to, to um, I, I mean, the, frame the discussion within the context of medicine. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for your talk and for broadening this perspective. I think it's very, very uh, interesting. But I'm not a philosopher, so I'm an engineer. Uh, so um, and of course, one question uh, I have is uh, maybe belongs to the first uh, comment of Mark. So we should not talk to elderly people in a stigmatized way, reducing them to age. So on the other hand side, if you talk about technology, you put together very, very different technologies. We are starting with atomic pump and Heidegger, robotics, implants for brain, assistive technology, whatever it is. So, and well, I'm, I'm not an expert in every of these technologies, but uh, especially in robotics, I would like to um, at least mention that within robotics, we have constantly change in the leading visions. What, what, what is robotics for? So, and this, of course, it's on one hand, determined by the technical abilities or physical restrictions we have to handle. And on the other hand, of course, visions by people. 
And um, you mentioned that robotics is maybe for replacing people, nurses or surgeons. I think this is an outdated vision. So if you look to robotics research nowadays, we have a cooperative or collaborative approach, working together, machine and human body, uh, complementary um, abilities, and of course, a fusion, how to do this, uh, and to, of course, uh, Solve a task, and uh, I think this is quite important. If we, if we talk about implications of technology, that you should have have this in mind. That yeah, there is no, no, no clear uh, vision. And the the vision. Part, I, I totally agree. What, what I see among medical students, for instance, they will not pick certain specialties because they know that machines will replace them. Radiology is a good example. We had a. Um, Oh, what was that? MD Anderson down in Houston. Uh, this the Watson, uh, you know, problem. Uh, the, this type of technology is more accurate in terms of diagnosis. So in some ways, it will replace human beings. Now you're talking about robotics, right? Um, are we going to go in that direction? I don't know, but I, I totally agree. I mean, we we need to 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 anticipate and and. Uh, and in my view, it's not replacing, but helping, supporting assistive technologies. It's not about the autonomous, again, with Mark yesterday, we had a long conversation with me. Uh, but again, we discussed that. So in, in, that, in that sense, I'm in favor of uh, technologies that will help support clinicians, but not replacing or, uh, you know, technology should always, we should always be able to turn off the technology. And, and, and have some control uh, okay. if I, add, um, I think we have to distinguish between diagnostic support and of course there is very strong technology and very accurate and maybe physicians may fear <laughs> about this technology well, uh, you, you, uh, but on the therapeutic part on the what? on the therapeutic part or rehabilitation part oh, okay. so technology is not very strong now. Yeah, yeah yeah that's that's the point that we yeah, have. Yeah, yeah yeah but again the type of work we do is we have to anticipate. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I agree with a lot yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Thank you. So, um, um, there's an online question from Alice Garcia. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much for the talk. And I have more of a general question related to communication and technology. So. Uh, looking at the development through the years of communications, so from the letters to phone calls, now to social media and texts, where people can just reply to someone else with a thumbs up or raising a hand, for example, like now. Um, I was wondering, what is your perspective on that? And a more specific question, what can we do not to just uh, passively um, suffer this process, let's say, and to stay human, like you mentioned before, uh, first to ourselves, but then later to our patients also. So, for example, in the, also in the communication of diagnostic results, using technology or not using technology. So I just wanted your opinion on that. Uh, it's, it's a good question, and I think it's an important question, because what you see, for instance, in uh, Wisconsin, well, I don't know where I'm supposed to look here. Here. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Um, because what you see, uh, so we have an electronic system. So you have a test, and then legally in Wisconsin, they have to post the test uh, on a website. You can go. It's called My Charts, and then you go, and then you have the test, the analysis. So yeah, you have a uh, you know the flu. This, but if it's about cancer, and or something like that, and, and then you, you have a you know information, you have absolutely no clue uh, what it means. Uh, I think it creates a lot of anxiety. Could create a lot of anxiety. And and I talk to to nurses and, and physicians, and uh, you have patients really reacting to that. So in terms of uh, communication. Is this the, the type of communication you're referring to? And, and how we can humanize it. So it's, it's very 
um, useful. You know, you have the test, boom, you have all the information you can read, it's available. They have to for, for legal or reason. But I think most patients don't have the expertise to, uh, to really understand. So in terms of communication here, I see the, 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 you know, the blessing and the curse. The curse of technology is because you, you leave patients uh, and, and some physicians, they don't have time to right away talk to the patient. So the, the human component is missing, um, so it has uh, its um, <coughs> benefits. Uh, everything is available, right? Uh, but in terms of communication, then I think there is the, the humanizing of, of the, the patient-physician relationship. I think the patient, uh, the, the, the physician is the expert, knows uh, the, the facts about the condition and should be able to communicate in ways that the patient will understand. Uh, is this the type of communication you were referring to? Yes, partially, yes. Um, I was just looking maybe first at the psychological perspective also, so to say, how can we not be influenced ourselves from the way of communication nowadays, um, that it's kind of reduced, and how can we fight this, let's say, when then we have to be still be human and respectful um, using these technologies. Well, I mean, then it's the whole debate about Twitter, about Facebook, and about Instagram, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how people communicate. And yes, uh, and, and what's very interesting among the younger generation is the way uh, I don't think the younger generation know how to date how to, it's, it's a platform, you look at the profile, it's a picture, X, X Y, and Z, uh, but instead of meeting in person, you go to a bar and you, you develop a, a relationship, you embody a, a persona as opposed to, you know, all these criteria, I don't know, I don't know this, I, you know, I'm too old for that, but the point is absolutely, I think technology is wonderful. I reconnected with people uh, when I was in, I mean, I'm in the United States, in Switzerland, via Facebook. Uh, that, that's wonderful. But in terms of, you know, I have that many friends and say, oh, I'm popular. But then when you see the, uh, especially for young women, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, there are some issues, suicides, depression, because I didn't have likes, uh, nobody likes me, or think. I mean, I'm pretty sure you, as a psychiatrist, you have cases like this. So I think this is where um, we need to be very careful how we use this technology. It, it, it's, it, as I said, there is a blessing. Yes, it's wonderful we can communicate. I can communicate with my wife. I'm here. She's in the United States. We, uh, we use a, an app and we can see each other. That's wonderful. But I would like to have a relationship like that for the rest of my life. I mean, you know, so anyway. But yes, excellent point. So, so thank you very much. Uh, we need to keep the coffee break at least to a, to a little extent because after that we will have the long session. So I asked uh, Eike uh, and Thomas to postpone your question to the final discussion round um, so that we can uh, have a short break now. But first of all, I want to thank you very much again. Um, so, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction, uh, which is really intended to explain the, the quote that, that I've used in my, in my title. Um, then I'm going to go over some studies and, and reviews, and a lot of this in some ways will, uh, will rehearse many of the things that have already been said, especially yesterday uh, during, during the meeting. Then I'm going to turn briefly to think about some ethical issues. Um, I, again, many of which have already been discussed in one way or another. Uh, and, then, and then I'm going to turn to Wittgenstein and, and, uh, and Heidegger. I have to say that, uh, that Fabrice's talk that he's just given, uh, as often happens in these things, um, uh, the, the talk seemed to have been very well devised because 
Fabrice has already spoken about Heidegger, and I'm going to speak about Heidegger. Uh, so it's good that one of us follows the other. In some ways, I think my talk could have been embedded in Fabrice's talk. And so I could have just sent it to him and he could have just said it all, which would have been fantastic. Anyway, and then, and then I'll try and answer, uh, answer the, uh, the question that I've set myself. So just a little bit of background. I don't know to what extent the term Luddites or, or Luddite is, is known outside of the UK, but uh, in England in 1779, there was this man called Ludd, who I think was being bullied and he went slightly berserk and he smashed up two knitting frames. Uh, so these were machines that were doing knitting. And then after that, there were then a number of clashes uh, culminating in, 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 in a whole series of these things happening with these Luddites between 1811 and 1816, when people would just go into factories and smash them up because they didn't like the idea of machines taking over from human beings. So the, the, the Oxford Dictionary uh, defines Luddite in this way. It says it's characterized by opposition to increased industrialization or the introduction of new technology. And on the whole, um, you don't want to be called a Luddite. It's not a very nice thing to be called. It implies, uh, it, it implies that you're old-fashioned, that you're not willing to accept change and so on. And I suppose the question I've been asking myself is, when it comes to assistive technology and so forth in connection with dementia, am I a bit of a Luddite? To what extent am I a Luddite? I think just to anticipate what I'm going to end up saying is that, that there's a little bit of me that is a Luddite, and I think that that's good. And uh, I'll try and explain why, why I think that. Anyway... Uh, then we come to Thomas Carlyle, who um, was writing shortly after all of these Luddite uh, problems, and, uh, and he was writing about the genius of mechanism. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, it says there, he was an essayist, historian and philosopher. His philosophy was a, a little bit weird, um, but uh, a very important thing he did was that he brought a lot of sort of German literature into... Uh, 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 he made people in the in the UK more familiar with German literature, both through translations and through his commentary on it. But anyway, when he was writing about the genius of mechanism, he said this. So these things, the things he was talking about, about mechanizing things, these things which we state lightly enough here are yet of deep import and indicate a mighty change in our whole manner of existence. For the same habit regulates not our modes of action alone, but our modes of thought and feeling. Men are grown mechanical in head and in heart, as well as in hand. They have lost faith in individual endeavor. So that's where the quote comes from that I, I've used in the, in the title of this talk. Um, so now what I'm going to do is, is launch into a very, very brief uh, look at some of the reviews. I have to say uh, beforehand that... Um, uh, I mean, I mean, much of this was covered, for instance, by uh, by Tenzin when she gave her, her talk the other day, um, uh, and by 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 other speakers in these symposium. Um, I haven't. This isn't. This doesn't reflect uh, a systematic review of the reviews or anything like that. This is just the reviews that came to hand uh, for me when I when I was when I was searching for things. And uh, uh, one interesting thing is that, there, that the literature has become huge, as, as everybody at this symposium now uh, knows. So here's a systematic review which showed that um, assistive technology was helpful with activities of daily living, with monitoring uh, safety and, uh, and helping with, um, with uh, health care. Uh, fewer devices helped with social aspects of care, at least when this review was done in 2015. Um, then uh, there's, here's another uh, uh, paper looking at saying that technology was well accepted and helpful, um, but making the important point that there's a lack of common methodology, methodologies in the research. And I suppose one ought to just note that this is an important 
ethical point, isn't it? That um, that we want the research to be done well, and there will be some reviews which later comment that the research is not always of the best quality. And we also then, if we're going to if we're going to start to do meta analyses of these things or systematic reviews, we need the methodologies to be sort of similar so that we can so that we can compare things better. Um, so so there are, so there are some sort of one can inject some doubts into uh, these reviews uh, because although most of them will say that assistive technology is helpful in some way, uh, we have to just keep an eye and make sure that we're being um, very uh, uh, appropriately scientific in the way we're doing these reviews. Um, and then there are, and then here's a, a paper saying that actually and so note that this was 2021, so it was after or sort of during COVID and, and, and saying that the provision of psychosocial interventions by assistive technologies might be useful as a way of combating uh, loneliness. Um, so, so on to some, fur some further studies. So this is a systematic review which says um, that most devices were used for safety and security uh, it then made the point that people living with dementia and their carers should help to co-design uh, devices. Um, and it then specifically raised some ethical issues. So it said that uh, it, it, it compared security and autonomy. And it made this point that safety seemed to negate all other ethical issues. So as soon as safety was raised, that was it. People had to be kept safe. Um, so not only should people living with dementia and their carers help to co-design devices, um, they should also be they should also be involved in decisions about the use of assistive technology. Um, so this then raises the issue of power, and power was something that uh, that Clara Berridge discussed uh, discussed yesterday. Uh, another another that, just to warn you, there there are seven of these uh, slides about studies and reviews. Um, so here's a systematic review looking at care homes and again, noticing that there are different methodologies, but picking up some positive outcomes. So uh, these uh, technologies were helpful in terms of complementing the work of staff, providing a sense of independence, enhancing well-being and social interaction. But there were also some challenges because sometimes alarms would go off, but they would be false alarms. The reliability of the technology was sometimes questioned uh, staff would get so used to alarms going off that they would ignore them. There was anxiety from staff about how to use this, how to use the technology, and there were also the problems to do with cost. They noted in this systematic review that, this, that the devices did not reduce falls. Uh, they also said that they should be acceptable to people living with dementia, and and then they. Uh, they raised the, the issue of privacy, which obviously has been mentioned many times uh, in, this, in this symposium. I just wanted to note that thing about staff ignoring alarms. Uh, I remember, I mean, numerous, many, many times being in care homes and there would be uh, an alarm. This was, not, this was not high technology. This was just somebody pressing a buzzer to say they needed help. These alarms would be sounding, beeping away, and staff would be running around too busy to go and see who was pressing the alarm or what the alarm was for. So that does seem to be a very real issue. Um, this study was looking at what might be uh, looking at facilitators and barriers to the use of, of assistive technology uh, and said carers generally wanted it. Um, they said uh, it could enable independence. The barriers were the cost, and also they said people with dementia did not want it. So carers wanted it, but people with dementia didn't. Uh, it improved cognitive function, it increased activities of daily living, and according to this review, it improved autonomy. But there was something odd about this, because when I looked at one of the specific papers reviewed in this uh, review, it, um, it said that um, it increased autonomy, but then it said that people with dementia didn't want it. So if we're respecting the autonomy of people with dementia, uh, then what we should do is not, is not use it, but then that would decrease their autonomy in some sort of way. So it's a bit of a, that's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, and then there, there is this very clear, well, at least in this review, there was this very clear dichotomy between 
carers who wanted assistive technology and people living with, living with dementia who didn't. Uh, and again, we see here the, the question of power. Um, a number of times people have said during the symposium that we shouldn't think that there's a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, this was, a, this was a, a paper which commented on the lack of good quality evidence. Uh, again, it said that people living with dementia should be involved in the design of devices. And it talked about a, a, lack, a lack of trust. Um, but usefully, I think, in this paper, they distinguish between assist, assistive technologies which were used by, with, or on the person with dementia. So using, uh, so technologies being used by people with dementia suggests autonomy, and there doesn't seem to be much problem with that. Technologies being used with also seems to be a good thing. So this is the, the carer using the, finding the technolog technological solution or using the technology with the person with dementia that's a way of building trust both between the carer and the person with dementia and between the person with dementia and the, the technology. But where things get difficult is when you're using technology on people living with dementia, so especially uh, in the more severe stages of dementia. And then, of course, we have a whole raft of problems, many of which have been, have been raised uh, to do with capacity, consent, best interest, and all, all sorts of other things. Um, so we're coming towards the end of this section of looking at studies and reviews. Uh, so this was a study looking specifically at robotic pets. So this is things like Paru and, uh, and so forth. And some very positive associations with, um, in terms of mood and affect, uh, communication and social interaction, companionship, uh, and other indicators of, of well-being. So, so we can. So these uh, these people were raising issues about beneficence and saying that this was a good thing. But then some more worrying things in terms of uh, perhaps the people sometimes misperceiving uh, misperceiving the um, uh, the these robotic pets as live animals uh, becoming too attached to them, uh, sometimes having negative reactions to them. There were also worries about uh, cost and hygiene. Um, now, uh, so this, that, this does remind me that um, <laughs> of uh, an example, uh, I, was, I was thinking of, this people, of, of people becoming too attached to them. So this reminds me of a real example in my experience uh, which was not actually to do with uh, with uh, a robotic pet. It was simply to do with a doll. So many of you involved in dementia or knowing about dementia care and so on will know that doll therapy, so you give people a doll and that helps to calm them down. But I remember very well we had a situation where a lady had been given a doll. She then became convinced it was her baby and she was she would never let it depart from her but she also became obsessed with trying to feed it and uh and to the detriment of feeding herself so actually she was even losing weight because she was always trying to feed the doll and so so, so this is the sort of thing that may not be anticipated but can be a quite quite a quite a serious uh, problem um and then um so, so most of the things I've been looking at have been kind of review type papers. But here was, I thought, I called it exemplary. And I ought to say that I know the main author, Rob Howard, who's a professor of whole day psychiatry at UCL in London. Uh, but if you read the paper, uh, it's extremely well done. It's a very good randomized controlled uh, trial. And what they showed was they found the provision of home-based technology installed following an individual needs assessment within current practice in England had no significant effect on the time that people with dementia were able to continue to live independently in their own homes. There was no evidence of cost effectiveness. So this was a study which was as careful as it could be. And yet it showed that one of the things that people often say about technology, so they often say, if you have this technology, you'll be able to live at home longer. 
And this study showed that that wasn't true. Now, of course, that depends on the particular technology. It, pretends, it depends on the particular way it was introduced and, and all sorts of other things. Um, but it is a warning to us that we do need to look at these things in a very clear-sighted way. And we shouldn't presume that they're going to do the things that we hope that they will do. Uh, and we should also note that, uh, that it wasn't cost-effective as well. That reminds me of another little uh, story from practice, which was that um, for a while I was the um, consultant in charge of a uh, unit for people with very severe dementia who also had behavioural problems, so often aggression, sexual disinhibition and so on. And uh, so this was a place where we'd actually used Haru, we'd used that um, very costly, uh, that very costly robotic pet, and uh, it had had some, it had definitely had some good effects. But one day I walked onto the unit and the men were standing around, the men who were living with dementia were standing around and somebody had got a soft football and they were, they were kicking the football to each other. And they were extremely happy and very relaxed and they were having fun. And it just struck me that how terrible it was that in all the years I'd gone there, none of us had ever thought to just give them a soft football and tell them to kick it around and have a bit of fun with it. Uh, so a very, very simple intervention seemed to be highly effective. And the football probably cost about one euro as opposed to paru, which cost, you know, 3,000 euros or something. So I think these, these, these are important matters to uh, consider. So I, I've been uh, talking about all these studies I hope you'll be able to have access to the slides afterwards, and this gives you the exact uh, references. So, that, so now I want to move on to think about um, ethics. The, the ethical issues that have already, I've already raised um, in the context of going through those studies are, are these. I mean, it, it is noticeable that a lot of these studies don't look at the ethical issues in, in very much detail. They're more interested in the... Um, the efficacy of the particular technologies, but 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 there's a list of things that we're all that we're all familiar with. Um, I've added to this slide um, some uh, some further ethical issues, which comes from a very small study which which we did some time ago. This was a survey. Um, so there there we've added to the list civil liberties, stigma, and dignity. I just want to make. Uh, a couple of points, because this wasn't a very brilliant study or anything, so I don't want to make too much of it. Um, but it was it was very striking. So we so we did this we did this survey about electronic tagging. We asked people to make decisions between using electronic tags on the one hand, or we gave we gave two other options, which were constant surveillance of the person one, by a, by a human being. Uh, or just locking the person up so that they wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to wander wander in inverted commas. Now, what was striking was that carers of people with dementia, who had especially those who had experience, first they were looking after, going out and walking, and so they didn't know where they were, had absolutely no objections to the use of electronic tagging. Um, but there was this. And the only people who did were the, the bunch of community psychiatric nurses that we uh, involved in a survey. So they showed a statistically significant difference from everybody else. Uh, so you could think that they were sort of acting as the, as the advocates of people with dementia and just recognising that, yes, safety is terribly important, but we still need to consider what's it like for the person with dementia? What might be the concerns of the person uh, with dementia? Uh, they might worry about their dignity, having things strapped to their legs or whatever. They might worry about civil liberties and so on. Um, I thought this was a, a, a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, paper, which really sums up many of the, many of the ethical issues. They, they've come up with themes from their from their study and then sub themes, just looking at uh, at the sub themes, um, 
privacy is fairly straightforward, that privacy, people were worried about their privacy being invaded. Uh, some people said, well, you know, privacy may even be impossible uh, given some sorts of surveillance. How is the data going to be stored and how might it be used in the, in the future? Um, worries about the person's autonomy, which I won't really go into. They're fairly uh, obvious, I think, especially to this, to this audience. Obtrusiveness. So this was um, a device was said to be obtrusive. It was uh, if it was either physically or psychologically too noticeable or too prominent in a manner that was undesirable to the person uh, concerned. Uh, then moving to the thinking about the outside world, there was the, the issue of stigma again. Uh, I mean, you're stigmatized with dementia if. Um, uh, if you you're wandering around outside in your in your nightwear in the middle of the night, uh, that's stigmatizing. But you're also stigmatized if you have to wear an electronic tag that looks like you might be a felon or or, or a prisoner in some way. Um, there was concern about loss of human contact. Um, uh, they said the loss of human contact may be the flip side to the independence. Uh, aimed at by assistive technology, um, they they noted in, in the in the this study they noted that um, uh, that health professionals also felt that um, that human good human contact was was a matter of good clinical care, which I think was the sort of point that Fabrice was making in the in the previous talk, and then there were worries about. Um, uh, uh, design and that 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 there should be an individual approach that people should be involved in deciding how things were going to be used on them or for them and so on. There were the worries about uh, cost and um, and just about safety. It was noted that just because somebody is being monitored, that doesn't in itself uh, guarantee the person's safety, which I th thought was an, an interesting point. Um, the, the same group actually then produced this paper where they looked at how surveillance technology was viewed by care professionals and ethicists and noted again this, this duality between safety and, and freedom. Uh, technology should be beneficial and aimed at the needs of indiv individual residents uh, and individual rights and privacy should be respected. So again, familiar themes, but... Um, but, but sort of pursuing this, the, 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 so familiar themes pursuing the same sort of points and same sort of tensions as well. Um, I, uh, you, you heard that I, I was on the National Council on Bioethics. Before I was on the council, I was on the working party, which came up many years ago with this report on, uh, on ethical issues. And um, I... Uh, so, so I'm biased, but I think that there. I think that the summary of the section of this report, which is to do with technology, I think it probably still stands, and I think it's probably as good as anything. So I, I'm sorry that I've included the whole thing here, and I'm, uh, but I will just read through it if that's okay with you. So what was concluded was that where a person with dementia lacks the capacity to decide for themselves whether to make use of a, partic of a particular technology, so the whole emphasis was on particular technologies for particular people, the relative strength of a number of factors should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So that was one of the very important principles in this whole report was that we should look at things case-by-case, -case, including the person's own views and concerns, past and present, for example, about privacy, but about other things as well. The actual benefits, so not just, not just the supposed benefits or the presumed benefits, but what are the actual benefits which are likely to be achieved by this device for this particular person? The extent to which carer's interest may be affected, for example, where they would otherwise have to search for the person with dementia in the streets at night. So the point here is, that the carer's interests also come into this. The report was keen on the idea, not just of autonomy, but of relational autonomy, which has been mentioned previously in the symposium. So we do need to pay attention to, to what carers think as well. And also there was, there was the worry about the degree of loss of human contact. Um, so what I want to start suggesting is 
is the sort of fundamental ethical concern comes out in this uh, paper, which was carried out uh, in Sweden, and it, it involved healthy uh, couples over the age of 70. So these people didn't have cognitive in, uh, impairment. And what it said was, or what the people said was, technical devices, regardless of the form in which they are used, are still only devices and cannot replace human relationships. There was a fear that the person would be reduced to a thing with relational coldness, detachment, and instrumentality. Elders regard human encounters as fundamental in care. So that uh, ends the, the section on, on ethics. And now I take a, a slight sort of uh, change in direction. And, uh, and look at some stuff from both uh, Wittgenstein and Heidegger. Interesting to note that they were both born in the same year. I don't know what significance that has, but it just seems interesting to me. I should say ahead of this that um, uh, my, my aim here is not to, it, so this is an exegesis, if, if you know what that word means. Uh, I'm not trying to say uh, what Wittgenstein uh, really meant or what Heidegger really meant, or I'm not trying to say exactly what they said. I will be presenting what they said, but my interest is more uh, in just ideas which arise from their writings, which I think is just useful to ponder whether or not we stick truly to what Heidegger or uh, Wittgenstein would have would have wanted us to say. I'm sure that uh, well, I'm sure that Wittgenstein would have been hugely annoyed because he seemed to be annoyed by lots of things uh, by by what I'm about to say. So, um, so I'm jolly pleased Wittgenstein's uh, not here. I'm not so sure about Heidegger. He he may have he may he may not have objected quite so strongly. But anyway. Um, so all the all the quotes from uh, Wittgenstein are from uh, well, apart from at the end, are from culture and value. And uh, what I'm really raising here is just something about the notion of progress, and specifically, I suppose, progress in science and technology. And I I just want to highlight some of the things that Wittgenstein said about this sort of thing. So. Uh, in 1930, he wrote, our civilization is characterized by the word progress. Progress uh, is its form rather than making progress being one of its features. So in other words, he's suggesting we don't always make progress, even though we kind of aim for it. Typically, our civilization constructs. It is occupied with building an ever more complicated structure. So, I, so this seems to me to be true on the face of it. We, it's a bit like a growth in the economy. Uh, this is something that the new prime minister in Great Britain is struggling with. She wants to get us, she wants to see us growing. We've got to have economic growth. And uh, so too, there's a sort of feeling that everything must always change. You can't stand still. We've got to progress in some way. So, so this is Wittgenstein noting that to some extent. 1947, he said, Science and industry and their progress might turn out to be the most enduring thing in the modern world. Perhaps science and industry, having caused infinite misery in the process, will unite the world. I mean, condense it into a single unit, though one in which peace is the last thing that will find a home. And so we start to get the feeling here that Wittgenstein is not that keen on the notion of progress, or at least he thinks there's something, uh, there's something mistaken about it. Um, we should note that this is 1947, so this is after the atomic bombs have been dropped in Japan. So, there's, so, so that partly explains why he's taking such a dim view of um, science and its ability to bring about peace. Um, and then just the final quote here, just partly because I like it. He said, man has to awaken to wonder, and so perhaps do peoples. Science is a way of sending him to sleep again. Now, I don't think it's very easy to understand what uh, Wittgenstein means by this. Uh, he certainly, as people will know, he certainly wasn't against science. As such, he was involved in uh, uh, 
uh, in designing jet engines when he was at Manchester before he before he took up philosophy. Um, in uh, during the Second World War, I know very well because I, I was mainly in uh, working in Newcastle on upon Tyne up in the north of England, and Wittgenstein went there during uh, the Second World War and helped uh, design some. Um, some instruments to measure blood pressure and pulse and so on, because there was research going on uh, looking at shock. And Wittgenstein became a sort of technical assistant to the research team. And he, and he seems to have loved it. He, so he seems to have loved designing these, uh, these machines to, uh, to, to measure these, the, the, these different physiological um, parameters. And, and indeed, uh, in, indeed, the, the team used to try to avoid going for walks with Wittgenstein at the weekends because Wittgenstein would just carry on talking about, uh, about the work and the design of the, and how we could measure blood pressure more accurately and, and, and so forth. So he wasn't against science and, and, and technology. Perhaps what we can say is he was against scientism. And I think again, uh, some of this emerged in, uh, in was was gestured at by some of the things that Fabrice was saying. Uh, so, scientism is the is the view that uh, that all of our problems can be solved by science, and not recognizing that there are some human problems which are human problems. They're not scientific problems. They have a different sort of uh, a different sort of character. Here's, I think, a, a, a very interesting quote, which I've given in the German as well. In 1947, he said, it isn't absurd, for example, to believe that the age of science and technology is the beginning of the end of humanity, that the idea of great progress is a delusion, along with the idea that the truth will ultimately be known, that there is nothing good or desirable about scientific knowledge and that mankind in seeking it is falling into a trap. It is by no means obvious that this is not how things are. So I think that last sentence, it is by no means obvious, uh, suggests that there may be a, a, a doubt about this, but he's pointing to something. He's pointing, and isn't it a shame that we can't quiz him to find out more accurately what, what he was going on about and uh, whether he thought that science and technology were really the end of humanity or whether he thought it was a way of thinking that might lead to the end of humanity and what would be, what would be the end of humanity? What, what did he mean by that? So there are all sorts of questions to be uh, raised that, that, he, that, that are raised by, by this quote. But nevertheless, I think, I think, it's, I think it's just worth pondering a little bit. I mean, one of, one of the other quotes from Wittgenstein that I, I love is uh, he was once uh, contemplating what to have as the sort of motto for one of his books. It may have been philosophical investigations, but I'm not sure. And he told <laughs> somebody that he was going to use a quote from King Lear, which was, I'll teach you differences. I'll, I'll teach you differences. So I think a Wittgenstein, uh, a Wittgensteinian, a Wittgensteinian tactic is often to say, well, can we think of a different sort of example, uh, which can we think of a different way in which this word is used, uh, which will give us a different sort of light on things? Let's not presume it's always this one way. I, I think we could use this against Wittgenstein here, and we could say, well, what else, instead of progress, what other words can we think of? So we might think of, for instance, uh, ad advances in technology. So we might say, well, it's, uh, maybe progress is a delusion, but nevertheless, advances in technology might still be useful. I was thinking, for instance, um, uh, for the first time for a long time, in the last year, we bought a new car. And, uh, and of course, as with all new cars, it has all sorts of gadgets attached to it, things that we never, never had before. Um, so it has something which keeps me in the right lane, stops me from meandering out into another lane. Uh, it has things which control my speed and so on. So all of these things, you might think, oh, that's progress. Well, it's certainly 
they certainly reflect advances in technology. Uh, but is it actually progress? I mean, how many times have I meandered from one lane to another in the last 40 years or so while I've been driving? I don't think I've ever done that in a, in a way that's dangerous. I mean, maybe it's more important now as I get older to stop me from meandering across the lanes. But just to go back to something even more basic, um, I, I, was, I then started to think about, uh, for instance, electric windows on, in cars. So now, nowadays, you just press a button and your window goes down. In the old days, you had to have a handle, which you had to turn to make the window go down. Now, we all think, oh, that's progress. But in what sense is it really progress? I mean, uh, it's progress because it's a little bit easier sometimes, but also uh, sometimes you want the window to be down just a little bit. And when you press the button to do it electronically, it just goes too quickly. And, and then you have too much air coming in the car. So then you try to press it to make it go up a little bit, but it goes up too far. So you spend ages pressing the little button when your window is going up, up and up and down. If you had a handle there, you could just do it very, very precisely. Now, there are other examples you could give where it's much better to have an electric window, but that's just, um, that's just uh, one, really one little example. I'm really sorry, Julian, I have to remind you on the time. You have now eight minutes left. Thank you very much. Uh, it, can I just check, are you always hearing me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Great. So, uh, so I'll move on from my examples about uh, uh, about cars. Just briefly, though, um, I I also wanted to just raise a question about progress in terms of dementia care. So, how much progress has there really been in dementia care? Um, if there, there's a very, very uh, thick book, which you probably won't be able to see uh, very well unless you look at the very small thing, but here it is. It comes out roughly every five years um, uh, called Dementia. It's edited by David Ames, John O'Brien and Alistair Burns. And uh, it, it's stuffed with advances in terms of our understanding of dementia. And yet this year, uh, a friend of my father had dementia. He was fairly well off. Uh, he uh, lived in the in the southeast of London, quite close to London, so near a sort of major centre for research on dementia. And uh, his care was abysmal. Now, that's only one example, but I mean, I have other examples where the care for people with dementia doesn't seem to have improved to me over about a quarter of a century while I've been uh, involved uh, with it. Um, let me just uh, finish this bit about, about Wittgenstein. So he was once, he went to a, a meeting in Swansea and, uh, uh, and Rush Rees recalls that in the discussion, Wittgenstein said that when there is a change in the conditions in which people live, we may call it progress because it opens up new opportunities. But in the course of this change, opportunities which were there before may be lost. In one way, it was progress. In another way, it was decline. He said a historical change may be progress and also be ruin. There is no method of weighing one against the other to justify you, in other words, Professor Farrington, uh, speaking of progress on the whole. Um, so we could think about this in, in more detail, but I, I just like this little bit, which is Farrington then said, with all the ugly sides of our civilization, I'm sure I would rather live as we do now than have to live as the caveman did. To which Wittgenstein replied, yes, of course you would, but would the caveman? Now, I think that's quite a funny joke. Uh, and it, it sort of makes, it's just useful to ponder that. But let's quickly now go to, to Heidegger. So, uh, so this is a, a summary of what I'm, what I'm uh, moving towards from John Macquarie, uh, who said, just as there is no existence apart from a world, so there is no existence apart from other existence. So he's, he's explaining to us what Heidegger is talking about. But the other existence is not seen as an object within the world, but as a co-Dasein. So many of you will know Dasein is, uh, really means the human existent in Heidegger's terms. Thus, we are related to the other existent, not in terms of the concern, handling, producing and the like, by which we relate to things, but in terms of a personal concern or solicitude that characterizes 
relations between cells. So one way, very briefly, to to uh, to show this is to so what I'm looking at at the moment is this is this computer, and I have a concern about it. I I, I clean it. I'm worried about it breaking down and so on. But then on the other hand, behind the door that's behind me, at the moment lives my uh, daughter, son-in-law, and their baby, who's now um, four weeks old. And, and about them, I have solicitude. Uh, and of course, I sought their permission to use that picture. I didn't seek my, uh, my computer's permission to get a picture of, uh, of it. And this is not the simple, it's not a simple point that I should just care more about my family than I do about my computer. It's, it's an ontological point. It's, it, and it's not just the point that we're social beings either, I don't think. It's not just a kind of psychological point. It's, it's more the point that at root, we can't be impervious to, we can't be immune to, we can't be indifferent to other human beings. When we think of what it is to be a human being, we can't be uh, indifferent or impervious to them. So this is what Heidegger says. There are only two or three of these quotes. Uh, so he talks about concern is a character of being which being with, so that's what characterizes uh, human beings, being with cannot have as its own, even though being with, like concern, is a being towards entities encountered within the world. So, so that's just ordinary physical entities like my computer. But those entities towards which Dasein as being with comports itself do not have the kind of being which belongs to equipment ready to hand. They are themselves Dasein. These entities are not just, are not objects of concern, but rather of solicitude. So he then goes on to say, even concern with food and clothing and the nursing of the sick body are forms of solicitude, this word first saw, uh, is grounded in Dasein's state of being as being with. Uh, and finally, Dasein's being reveals itself as care. So, I, so the next quote shows a sort of hierarchy because being in the world is essentially care, being alongside the ready to hand, so that's just equipment and so forth, could be taken as concern. And being with the Dasein with of others as we encounter it within the world could be taken as solicitude. Um, so here's a summary of what I want to get from Wittgenstein and Heidegger. So from Wittgenstein, we mustn't be fooled into thinking that because it's scientific and technological, it's therefore better. And we mustn't think that the only solution would be a scientific and technological one as opposed to a human one. And from Heidegger, I think we get this, that things in the world are important to us, have meaning for us, but human beings stand in a different relation to us. This is the nature of our being. Human beings require or demand a type of care or concern that is not simply technological, but which reflects something deeper, namely solicitude. So, uh, there's a bunch of references where I cover some of this stuff, which I'll quickly pass over and onto my conclusions. Uh, so, so here's the question. In dementia care, have we grown mechanical in head and in heart? And if so, so what? Uh, I think there is a temptation to grow mechanical in head and in heart, but I think that we should resist it. We should resist it at least a bit because of course, we should use assistive, assistive technologies when they're helpful to the individual person. We have to add here, with their consent, in their best interest, etc., 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 with regards to privacy, looking at the individual uh, technology and the individual person and so forth. But at root, the nature of our being as persons is that we require real, authentic engagement, solicitude, not just care. The word authentic, as many of you will know, I'm pointing back towards Heidegger and the idea that this, this, is what, this is what marks us out if we can live authentic lives. So to grow too mechanical is to lose our humanity. It's to have lost faith in the importance of the authentic individual encounter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, perfect in time. Uh, <laughs> So um, thank you very much and uh, I think we have some points to discuss or questions and I would open. Could you unshare his screen please? Could you, could you unshare his screen? Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.
questions, remarks. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, and I, I, I totally agree uh, that I think what resonates your and Fabri's talk, I think, is a very fair and, and, and seriously taken concern about the so-called dehumanization of, let's say, especially the, the medical field because of putting too much faith and over-trusting technical system. So I'm totally with you in general. But I mean, especially you, Julian, I would be curious to hear, I mean, given the fact I think that you have worked for many years in dementia, uh, I was wondering, at least perhaps it's my impression since the last 15 years, I have now worked on dementia research and, and how dementia care has I'm not sure, uh, changed or has been discussed um, the last 20, 25 years. I mean, could you be so kind and reflect a bit how the caring about persons with dementia in the last 100 years, so just taking the, the time of Heidegger and Wittgenstein, I think would be an interesting starting point how people have been treated then with regard to um, being diagnosed, I mean, Alzheimer's uh, diagnosis was in the beginning of the century then, and what happened in mental health uh, facilities, and where we are now, and ha is this a kind of decline, or is the progress, if, if you would say there was a progress, and in my sense there is a lot of advancement, what has happened, how we deal with people with mental illness, including dementia, especially in the 20th century um, and is this because we have been become again more social more caring or is this also an advancement of te technology in a broad sense means having different structures different types of healthcare systems so i would be curious at least if you can comment on that a bit um. yes no thank you thank you very much um well, you, you've asked me to reflect on the last hundred years, so uh, but I'll try and be brief uh, in, in my in my response. Um, well, of course, of of course, in in some sense, we, we just must say that things are better. Things must be better than they were when people were just put into the back wards of hospitals, uh, of psychiatric men mental institutions and just, and just left there, which is how, which is how things were being done, uh, you know, a hundred, a hundred years ago. So of course, there's, that seems to be an improvement. Even there, however, uh, I want to just inject a note of, uh, of caution, uh, because, you know, the asylums have a very, very bad reputation but of course when the asylum started uh, they were some of them were considered to be uh, quite good institutions with Pinel in France and, and so forth and I remember in my uh, very early days uh, going to an old asylum before it was shut down not, not too far from where I am now and uh, people had lived there for most of most of their lives. So this is not just to do with dementia, it's also to do with just mental health generally. But they had, they had a block for assisted uh, work. And so people living in the asylum would go to this place to work. Now, that seems to me to be a positive thing, that people actually, they had something to do. The question is, where are those people now? Well, they're out in the community. They don't have work. They're often living in hostels, which are pretty rubbish. They wander around the streets during the day. People in the local community don't like them and so on. Now, and, and something similar has happened in, uh, in terms of care for people with dementia, that some of them find themselves in smaller institutions, but nevertheless, they're still institutions. I remember going to one care home it was a it was a big cavernous room, and so this isn't long ago. I'm not I'm not that old. This wasn't a hundred years ago. Uh, it was a cavernous room. The television was just blaring away. I was looking for a member of staff. I couldn't find any member of staff, and uh, 
people were shouting out things. And then a lady said to me, a lady who otherwise I couldn't really understand what she was saying, but she suddenly said to me, whatever happens to you, don't end up in a place like this. Now, this is something that was said to me in the 21st century. So, uh, so there, is, there is progress in some ways, but there's a kind of lack of progress in other ways. Uh, so let me just give you two more very kind of quick examples. One is that we now have medication in around about, uh, at the, uh, in the 1997, I think, in the UK, we started to have these tablets for people with dementia. But have they really changed things? The, the official line is to say that they produce a modest improvement. But what is a modest, what does that really amount to? Now, for some people, a modest improvement turns out to be quite useful. For some people, though, you give the tablets and they really don't have much of an uh, obvious effect. Um, so, so, that's, so that's a kind of biological example of where there's been, there's been an advance. We've developed these tablets. The science behind those tablets is fantastic. But what has it actually achieved? Compare that then to psychosocial approaches, where again, there's been lots and lots of work about person-centered care, relationship-centered care. How can we improve things? In some places you see things improving, and then you go so somewhere and see terrible things happening where things are not improving. Uh, I think that technology is gonna have the same sort of fate, that in some places technology is gonna be really helpful. It's going to be really helpful when we have really uh, committed staff who are thoughtful and apply it in a thoughtful, caring way. But in other places, people will just chuck in some technology and hope that it makes a difference, but it probably won't. So, so those are my reflections. I don't know if I've answered your question perfectly or whatever. Okay, we have um, three other questions right now, and I would uh, say I close uh, the table now. Um, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Julian. I really enjoyed your talk, and my question goes in a similar direction as Silke's question. I mean, what I took from your talk was um, that we should be critical about this narrative of, of progress. Um, and that's, I think, a very valid point because we have a habit of thinking about science and technology in, in terms of progress, like automatically. But uh, applied to dementia care, the question really is what, what either progress or decline. So these are the two storylines, aren't they? Um, but when it comes to dementia care, and you raised that point, uh, the question is, what would count as progress in dementia care at all? So what are the criteria at, at all for, for or the, the aims, so to speak? You know, is it about increasing autonomy? Is it about increasing well-being of patients? Is it about increasing cost efficient, uh, efficiency of, of dementia care? Is it a mix? Uh, of all these things, uh, and I think that's an important point uh, to keep in mind. So we have to kind of reflect on what what, what we want to achieve at all. Uh, and I just wanted to ask about y y what your um, idea would be. What what should count as progress in in dementia care? And I think I'll just skip the second question before that we don't have the time. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> right. And I'll. I'll try to be brief, but since you know me quite well, Mark, you'll know that that's difficult sometimes <laughs> for me. But um, uh, so, I, so this is, this is a, a very good question. I, I think I'm going to give uh, a, a slightly boring answer because I think that what, what will count, what are, what are the criteria for, for progress? What do we need for progress in terms of dementia care? And I'm gonna come back to the same sort of Heideggerian point that what we need is people who are thoughtful, reflective, uh, can actually convey solicitude and, and so on. Now, uh, and, and so, because you, you gave a little list there, Mark, of things like autonomy, well-being, cost efficiency, and so on. Uh, the trouble is the reality of dementia is that eventually you don't have autonomy. Uh, eventually, uh, well, I don't want to say you don't have well-being, but your well-being is going to be severely compromised. And eventually to look after you, it is going to cost uh, a, a certain amount of money uh, uh, and so on. 
But to maximize things, to make things as good as possible for you, we need, uh, I, I, I'm tempted to say, we, uh, I'm tempted to kind of name someone because I've worked with particular nurses, for instance, who are just fantastic at this. They're also fantastic at applying technology. So for instance, I mentioned that we worked in a unit which had this paro, this robotic, robotic seal. And, uh, and there were some nurses who were very good at figuring out which patients would benefit from it and then introducing it to those patients in a way that was sort of helpful and helping them to, as it were, use it. Uh, and that's, that's what you need. You need those people who can do that. You don't need the nurses who just go and shove it on somebody's lap and turn it on and hope for the best. And uh, so I think it's that kind of human thing that we need, as well as the technology. There may be other issues to do with uh, technology, but those are issues which I think which engineers and so forth uh, can sort out. I mean, they're kind of technological problems about whether robots are going to, um, you know, when, when we're all doing our shopping using robots, are they going to start bumping into each other? Are they going to start trying to steal each other's food and so on? Uh, or, or whatever. But so, so they're kind of technical questions, which I'm sure people, clever people can, can sort out. But when it comes to people with dementia and technology, we need it to be done in a humane, caring way and in a, in a thoughtful way. So next is uh, online, Alice. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. Uh, I think uh, a little bit it touched the last questions I was making about communication and technology. So when you mentioned that we should not be indifferent to other people, maybe as a consequence of technological progress, then I started to think also, yeah, that's maybe important as researchers that we set priorities. Uh, so for example, for patients with dementia, I was thinking one of the problems is that they are socially isolated at some point. They don't have contacts. So maybe first it would be necessary to build a social community and then maybe apply the technological assistive tools. And my question to you was, um, what do you think, what else can we do to, to remind ourselves uh, not to be indifferent to other people? Or do you have any other idea to go towards this direction? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, Alice, that I completely understood the question. So, so when you said, do you have any idea not to be uh, different, what, what do you mean? Well, no, I mean, do you have any idea how people can remind themselves not to be indifferent? Indifferent. Uh, when, when in this world where technology is progressing and we are all overwhelmed by it, researchers and clinicians themselves, and how can it be yeah, prevented? Right. Sorry, I... I miss the, I thought you said different rather than indifferent. Uh, well, so I think that's, I think that's the important thing. It, uh, I, I think you've sort of put it correctly that the thing is not to be uh, in, indifferent. Um, so I think we can, uh, uh, and I suppose what I would come back to is the, those various bits of research, those various reviews, uh, which have encouraged us to include people living with dementia. Now, there's a lot of, as you probably know, there's a lot of research looking at how you can do that. Uh, it's easy enough when somebody has a sort of pre-dementia, a sort of mild cognitive impairment, you can get those people to come along to meetings and take part in, in things. It then becomes more difficult as they have mild and moderate uh, dementia. But it seems to me that, that that's the crucial thing is to, is to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're uh, designing, uh, designing a, a bit of kit or whether we're designing a research project or designing an environment, we need to have some input from the people that it matters to most. And I think we should take a kind of warning uh, I mean, certainly when I started out doing uh, research in ethics, you know, we always went to the carers of people, the family carers of people with dementia. 
And of course, the family carers of people with dementia are immensely important. But, but now, you know, the, the push is to go to people living with dementia themselves and try to get their views. Because uh, as we've seen in the research, the families are gonna say, oh, safety, that's the thing, safety. Somebody living with dementia may not say safety. So, uh, so I think we'll make things better and we will be, we won't, sorry, we won't be indifferent <coughs> if sitting next to us uh, in our design meetings for whatever is somebody with dementia who says, yes, that would be really helpful or no, I'm just not, I'm not interested in that at all. Thank you very much. Well, um, it's nothing good or desirable about it, but I have to say we are um, out of time. But we have two further questions on the list, and so I would suggest that these questions, we understand them as first questions in the general and <laughs> final discussion, and uh, you're welcome to integrate Julian uh, in this final discussion. So we have now Eiken. For now, or do I wait for it? Okay, okay, there's a question for Julian. Thank you for your, for your talk. I was, um, I found uh, you cited um, a paper by Howard and colleagues. I found these findings really interesting. Um, that they found that technology had no significant effect on the time people with dementia were able to live independently at home. And I found it really striking because this is like, this is the goal of uh, technical assistance systems to pro provide the ability to live uh, longer at home. And I was wondering if you, referring to the Wittgensteinian idea of progress being some sort of a two-way street, so to say, um, if the very idea of implementing technical assistance systems um, in order to enable people with dementia to live at home is already an expression of, of us growing mechanically in, in head and heart. Um, well, th thanks for that. I, I think that's an interesting thought. And in some ways, I don't want to, I don't want to say much, much more ab about it. I, uh, except that maybe I, maybe I now want to be a bit critical of Wittgenstein, who normally I, Normally, I like to just agree with him if I can. Uh, but so, so yes, that, um, or, or, or maybe this is an anti uh, uh, Carlyle point rather than anti Wittgenstein point. But um, because, because, yes, so people are looking for technological solutions to keep us at home longer. So, so to that extent, we, we're growing, you know, that, that's our head and hearts being taken over by the whole kind of technological thing. But, but actually, that's not a bad thing. I mean, every, you know, when we talk to people with dementia, when I talk to you, when you talk to me, we'll all say we'd like to stay at home as long as possible. We don't want to be carted off to some horrible institution. We're all going to say that. So that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, I, I think it's very important that, that uh, Rob Howard and his colleagues got that result. But of course, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't look for other technological ways that are going to be acceptable and that might help us to stay at home longer. It's just that whatever the ways that they looked at didn't achieve it in that study. Now, it, it might, it, I, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what they used, but I suspect that it was fairly basic technology. I don't, I don't, think, it, I don't think it was a whole kind of smart home or anything like that. It was probably just, you know, warning signals and so, and so forth. So, so let's look a little bit harder for, uh, for things that are going to work. But we've got to keep all these other things in mind, that, uh, that it's got to be acceptable to the people involved and, uh, and so on. Thank you. So last question on my list is Andreas. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to point um, to two questions. First is, um, well, I do not really like this idea of linear progress. I mean, from my point of view, we, especially in technology, we, we talk about paradigm changes um, and, of course, phases of some technology. And 
Well, this is not only purely a technical thing, but also a thing of the most valuable companies nowadays are pushing this. So if you talk about Apple, Microsoft, Google, then of course this is not an independent thing. So there are really people pushing this. And therefore, from, from my point of view, uh, we on one hand should discuss of, well, is there a linear progress possible? This is one thing. And the second thing is, of course, we as scientists have to be critical uh, against this, well, thing, digitalization, AI. So, and of course, therefore, it's important to, to talk about negative results in the studies. So this is one part, and the second part is, on the other hand side, if we take serious what we discuss here, so adaptability of, a, uh, of technology towards the individual needs of persons, and of course the different dimensions we have if we measure the uh, importance of technology, then on the other hand side, I do not see how we can collect evidence about this. So this is a general problem in personalized medicine, but also in our research about private homes. So if we enter with our technology private homes, we have to ask the people what we can do there. So of course we cannot install a standardized set of sensors and then therefore can compare different people. It's simply not possible. We have to ask them, we have to adapt the technology to, towards their specific rooms, their specific needs. And therefore I have problems really to, to, to uh, generate evidence by comparable uh, technology. So this is the second point, this is very critical, I think, if we discuss technology and how we develop the technology and how we compare, of course, technology. Um, I, I, again, I, Andreas, I may not have completely understood what the what the question is, but... That's uh, more rather, rather a comment, maybe. All right, yeah, no, okay, well, so I think that... <laughs> So, so in which case that makes life easier for me, and I think it's I think it's a good I think it's a good comment. I mean, of course, uh, of course, you and people at this symposium are thoughtful people who are doing things in, in a thoughtful way. I, I, I suppose if I was going to introduce a, a caution, it is that it's it's the caution of about what happens when this is then expanded, and uh, as suddenly everybody is given these. Things. So that, that was also the, you know, the worry in the old days when we were just talking about electronic tagging and tracking. Of course, when thoughtful people used electronic tagging and tracking, it was fine, really, because they would talk to people and so on. But it's when, you, it's when it gets out there and anybody can just turn up and put a track on people or, or, or whatever, that's the worry. So... Uh, so that, that's the first thing. I, I think that, that there's the difference between people who are expert and thoughtful doing things and then just the general, then things just happening in the general population. So that's one thing. The, the other thing is I, I accept the point about, uh, I simply agree with you about sort of, as it were, paradigm shifts and, uh, and the idea of linear progress and, uh, and that actually things do need to just be tried. I mean, that's how science works isn't it that we try things and uh and we look at things in particular contexts and that then changes how we might do things the next time so there are these kind of you could almost call them sort of hermeneutic circles where we go into the world and then we come back and we think about things and we go into the world again and maybe at some point there'll be some sort of leap as we suddenly realize that that there's something that's much better that there's something that's much better uh, and so on. So I sort of just agree with your with your uh, comment, and thank you for it. I thank you all um, here, but especially um, you, Julian, for your inspiring talk and um, keynote. And we now go into the uh, final discussion on future directions, points to consider. And I may um, give. So pass the <laughs> micro to uh, Silke and Mark, Mark. as far as I know. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Julian. And we hope you can still stay with us for the final discussion round, which we would really, really appreciate. So um, I might start again, but it's a kind of a continuation of the last uh, talk again about raising some very general 
perhaps it's more an observation and it, it might kind of mirroring what I learned uh, the last um, two and a half days about, I think what is really also at the heart of the current debate among ethicists, engineers, colleagues from the medical uh, faculties. And this is first, the first thing I just want to raise again. And this is the question, what actually is our understanding of technology? So somehow this seems a bit the elephant in the room or in the sense that I think we do not have a shared understanding of what technology here means. So on the one hand, I observe that, for example, the, the, the understanding of technology seems to be quite narrow. Narrow in the sense that it's often associated, I mean, to put the, the terminology of Julian here again, um, on board means namely a very narrow mechanical um, artifact, so to say, like the machine that replaces um, the, the robot, so to say, as a kind of stereotypical image. Then I, th I really would like to pose again the question, what is your understanding of technology? And I think this is a bit also what, what is necessary for future conversations to have a more uh, to clarify exactly. So I'm just saying, I think some of the criticism that targets technology as to be a, a risk for human medical care has been, I think, um, been uh, dispictured in a very general way. I think you already made this claim, um, Andreas. And it has a kind of very generalized idea that the technology is something that is mechanical. It's often associated with particular artifacts like robots. It's, um, or, or let's say in other areas, it's, it's a te technique of gene sequencing or something like that. And then I think at least perhaps that's my uh, also a bit weird um, uh, understanding is that, that the term technology, my understanding is much broader. Writing a letter by, by your hand is also technique. You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunately, I think, and unfortunately, uh, I'm happy not to be a cave woman and cannot write a letter, but I see, of course, it makes a difference whether I write here a WhatsApp message um, or whether I write a three page letter. Of course, this makes a difference. But this is, again, I think where we need to head on is namely to have a more differentiated um, debate on and discussion what type of technology we are facing. And then again, I think, and this is, of course, again, the big question is whether our understanding of technology is something that is out of or even in contrast to the human social system, so to say, or whether we always understand te technology, this is not used and um, designed by humans, it's not really technology. So you know, te any type of technology is always a kind of socio-technical system. So because you can think also in the history of technology and technique, there were a lot of things invented, but nobody used it. And so, so what, so to say, in a sense, this is of course tech technology that existed, but it has no social cultural meaning. And I think this is for me at least something where I feel that when it comes to assisted technology in dementia care or in general in care, it's really important not only to isolate the technology and say the technology is the problem, but it's always the interaction of those. I mean, you made it very nicely, Julian. It's about the doctors, for example. Do doctors tend, because of technology, not to talk anymore sufficiently with empathy? And this is a serious risk. I mean, we have observed this in many types of, of care um, situations, I mean, especially the introduction of computers in, in care facilities in hospitals to collect better data, for example, has actually led to the, to the fact doctors are not looking anymore during conversations to patients, but they look at the computer screen. And this and this is not a high tech. I mean, this is computer screens we use all the time. But this tiny little thing, this the habit, so to say, not to look in the face of a patient, but always to look on the computer screen and then 
you type in what the patient is saying. I think this is for me one of the most problematic changes. And, and in a sense, because this is exactly what you were criticizing, this is dehumanizing the personal relationship between doctors and patients. And then this is the interesting question when we discuss assistant technologies, um, whether it's censoring, it's mentoring, it's improving emergency calls, and so on and so on, whether this also happens or whether we can also change or improve human habits, how to use this technology. And this is, I think, what is a bit still missing, I guess, that when you develop technology, you also have to, do, to, to train or develop humans still to use it in a way that's appropriate. And obviously, this has been a bit overseen in the last uh, years, at least decades. At least an observation I had, and I want to mirror back, and I would be curious now to hear on the one hand what the engineers and informatic colleagues say, and what perhaps the, um, yeah, the colleagues from philosophy and ethics would reply on what is their understanding of technology. Who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, Andreas, please. Yeah. Well, uh, from my point of view, it's, it's really important to differentiate technology approaches before judging about this. So, and uh, especially if we talk about uh, dementia uh, and, uh, of course, well, diagnosing dementia, well, handling dementia, whatever, managing this. It's for me quite important to at least differentiate with diagnostic things. So because this is in the hand of uh, medical doctors, it's not in the hand of a patient usually. This may change in the future, but usually this is high tech that is used by professional users. So and of course the discussion of participation in the design process of these devices do not play a major role. And of course acceptance and something like this plays a different role when we talk about, rather than we talk about um, this, well, what happens after this, so in the, in the managing of dementia at home or in the nursing home. And of course, for this technology, this is really different. And of course, the design principles have to be different, I, I presume. And um, as I already mentioned, I think um, quite often, this, was your example, Julian, um, if you talk about uh, well, whatever intelligent assistance systems at home. So from my perspective, quite often we do not have assistance there. So we have a lot of monitoring systems. So this is, of course, closely connected in some way with diagnosis. But what kind of assistance we really do there or implement there? So this is quite often not clear. So simply asking somebody outside, yeah, there's a change in the behavior or something like this, is not really assistance by assistance systems. So and, uh, from, from my point of view, uh, real assistance system, it means I have a close connection with a technical device, and this system helps me, for instance, toothbrushing or something like this. We do not have very much um, evidence or examples of systems or approaches uh, to do this because this is quite new and really demanding technology. Mm -hmm. Probably we should talk about more specifically about the conditions of such technology. So this is, I think, the future. So we focus more on the assistive thing. Yeah. What, what exactly we would like to assist? So activity of daily living is quite clear, of course, um, but how? So, and uh, what, what kind of technical meanings, but or what, what kind of concerns from philosophical point of view we have if we do such interventions? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, directly uh, with regard to, to you, Andreas. Um, but why can't um, a monitoring system not be an assistive system. I would say it is an assistive system. Of course, it is not assisting, for example, the, the person with dementia, but it is assisting the caregiver or the professional caregiver, the, the, the physician, in monitoring the patient. He couldn't monitor in the same way without the monitoring system. May, may I answer that? Yeah. From my point of view, we can talk about either closed 
loop systems or open loop systems. And monitoring is for me an open loop system. So an expert or relatives are involved and of course this is an indirect assistance uh, asking the caregiver to do something for the people. And closed loop systems are the system itself directly mm -hmm. on, on what, what I would like to do. And this is really a difference in technology design. Mm -hmm. I have yeah, thank you. Um, I think it is important to distinguish between different perspectives or scopes on technology. I agree on the one hand that when we criticize certain technologies, it's really important to look at what is the goal of this concrete technology and what is this the concrete functioning in order to say how do we need to train caregivers in order to use the technology. Um, correctly in a human way and, and whatsoever. But on the other hand, I find it really also really important um, to, um, to take into perspective who was saying in the last two talks to, to broaden the perspective and to take some sort of phenomenological, existential or anthropological perspective on technology. What does it mean to use technology? What does it mean to live in a digital space, in a digital society, and, we have, and when we have this broad perspective, I think, can really look at the um, question you raised, the, or the distinct, distinction you made. Why is it different to write a three-page uh, letter and, uh, to just writing a message in WhatsApp? What is the certain difference, and why is it different, and why do we feel different in this, in this respect? So there's two perspectives on technology, and I think both are valid. Mm. Yeah, I have Thomas and then Fabrice. I think the, the last comment by Eike is, is really a helpful one because I mean my main point was what I that I do not really understand the question because it is so extremely vague. Um, if you say, what, what do we see as technology, and you start with writing letter, yeah, then of course the first example for technology has been picking up a stone. Um, there has no long, deep, there, at that time there has not been a big debate of the social consequences of inventing this technology, let alone the first kind of arti artillery, Speerschleuder, technique damals, big advance there. Um, <coughs> Um, this is then taking the, the, this, this discussion on su such a broad scale that engineers from the domain of electrical or computer science are not able to contribute any, anything meaningful because their special knowledge in their field is not helpful for that general social technical debate, which of course needs to be taken and which uh, needs to be performed and which of course needs to uh, reflect also the parts or the specific impact of uh, information technology so um, and the point you made exactly pulling apart these two different aspects of how to talk about technology the general aspect of course we need at the social level to discuss uh, what the impact of novel technologies are on so uh, on the uh, on the social structures how they change the perceptions of what humans are and what care is is definitely important but on the other hand, uh, when we see, okay, we have this interesting study by Howard et al. 2021. Smart homes are no use and a waste of money. Um, which is really, really interesting. And uh, which Julian mentioned, it might be that they were simply looking at, well, trivial technology trivial technology at the viewpoint from people doing research on robotics and artificial intelligence. And as Philippe pointed out the day before yesterday, I think rightfully that assistive robotics, meaning assistance in helping the person with dementia in performing activities of daily living is not in the place yet. And if you think about the impact of assistive technology in the Per, uh, personal home and then intermingle this study by Howard et al. saying okay it is of no use with the fact that possibly the technology we are looking for is not even existing yet in a sufficiently reliable way uh, then we are curtailing um, 
research in this direction, in the direction of the technology that really would make a difference because technology had been investigated that could not make a difference given the problem that needs to be solved. I mean, if you just have monitoring technology, and if you look at that, if you have monitoring technology in the private home, of course, if you have a new, new diagnostic instrument, tendency will be that you detect the disease, a pathologic situation earlier than before. So it might have even been expected that the effect is a negative one because that the, in the homes where this technology existed, people are getting sent to nursing home even earlier than before because you have a better early estimate of the deterioration of the situation. Yeah. That, was, that was not, not a, at all a comment to the, to the question you raised, but just some general musings. Yeah, but I think it helps to clarify how we had uh, different <coughs> understandings, and that was, yeah. And then Fabrice, please go ahead. Well, I wanted to make the same point as uh, Heike. And so you asked the question how, but the question why is where you're going to ask the, the kind of questions about anthropology, about ethics, about values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I think it seems to me that the, the collaboration uh, between engineers or people in the technical fields and science and people in the humanities and, and medicine is so important because we're asking different questions. And then when we, we have that perspective, I think we have a holistic view and we say, well, how do we do this? But I'm gonna say, why are you doing it? And what values are driving what you're doing? And then we can have this kind of interchange and exchange of ideas, so. Yes, and then I will hand over to Mark to moderate. Well, I, I, I agree, with you, but we have to well try to parallelize, parallelize, um, do in parallel, do in parallel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry about this. <laughs> do in parallel different discussion uh, lines. So of course, also for us, it's quite important this question: Why we do this? Why we? design technology that may compensate deficits of people. So this, of course, you can criticize this. So, uh, yeah, we are just focused on uh, deficits rather than well, empowering or something like this. So this is, but, but this is not very close connected to what we usually do. So it's a general discussion that it's quite important to understand what are the basic assumptions behind our work and, of course, in which direction we should go if we have different ideas. And the second well, discussion should be the direct overlap of our, uh, of our disciplines. So, especially how we do uh, the concrete design of technology. Should we do it in a participatory design? What kind of well, non-technical things we have to take into account. So, of course, I cannot measure autonomy of a human, but of course, it seems obviously important. Uh, yeah, it's difficult for me to operalize, operalize this, um, but, uh, yeah, so, so, but it's important to translate this into a technical design. And this is, I think, it's maybe for us as engineers or computer science, more fruitful and a closer cooperation. But this doesn't mean that the first thing is unimportant or it shouldn't be done. Can I answer? Yeah, never direct, yeah. So, but I'm wondering if it reflects how we do science in, in this complex world or technoscience, because it seems to me that it's not science and technology, technoscience. But it seems to me that more and more <clears throat> we do uh, this type of technological development hand in hand. And, and so I think the problem with for ethicists and philosophers is you develop the technology and then we're running after you guys and say, well, now the, you know, the, the horse left the, 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 the barn. And then we have to catch up. Instead of being proactive and try to integrate these questions and challenge the way you do it. Uh, and, and I think in my view, it might be more fruitful than this parallel type of, I wasn't sure what you, you meant by parallel, but it seems to me that the world of facts and the world of values should be intertwined and discussed. And, 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 and this is how we, I think we're gonna make good progress if progress is 
It's good. <laughs> Just gonna dir directly comment comment on this. Um, it is really interesting to see how this value based consideration, which tends to be on a meta level, can very directly project it to the to the techno scientific questions that need to be solved in order to provide the right level of, of assistive technology. Uh, for instance, if you, if, you, if you think about robots um, helping people with everyday activities in the, in the private homes, the main challenge is of course to understand the current situation so that the robot is able to see, okay, this person there is trying to prepare a cup of tea. And I see that the person has not yet put the kettle on the oven. Therefore, I decide and go and take the uh, take, uh, pick up the uh, kettle, bring it over, and put it on the stove. And this is a really hardcore image processing, artificial intelligence, uh, probabilistic reasoning, motion planning problem. And, and uh, the thing is, it needs to be solved before we can realistically think about having such uh, such a technology. And this is the interesting thing is solving this problem has indeed nothing to do with any values because it's an image processing problem. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is, I mean, we, we have to solve this problem. We have to be we have to think about solving this problem. Um, and this is independently of, of the other considerations. And in, in so far, these considerations solving these technical problems are indeed completely independent in parallel of thinking about, OK, and if we had such a technology in place, what then would that mean? Can I answer quickly? <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally agree. But you can take examples where it's going to be much more complicated because it's about monitoring uh, people, Wh whatever technology, it could be a monitor, it could be a sensor, or things like that. Then it becomes, of course, you know, warming up water, yeah, okay, it's a technical problem, of, of course. But I think it, we're talking more about issues related to, uh, you know, data mining, uh, monitoring, say, uh, uh, collection of data, and then confidentiality, things like that. <laughs> So my question is, are you going to develop technology regardless of the implication and then say, well, now we're fixing a technical problem, let's see the implication, as opposed to say, why am I developing this, this technology, what are the implications, and what are the, 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 the values, the, the, the moral issues, potential moral issues, and, and, and so this is the, the, the problem. You think like an engineer, I think like a philosopher, and I think we need to come to a consensus you know, and, and, and try to work together as opposed to say, we're going to fix the problem and then fix the ethical problem with the social implication, as opposed to say, well, okay, this is what you want to do. Let's think about, let's have a thought experiment. In this case, I think it's helpful and, and see the implications. So, but it, it's, it's a debate that we need. Well, uh, I mean, no, 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 sorry. sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, this is, sorry. Oh, sorry. This, this discussion to have this kind of debate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm and I'm going to let you continue in just a minute. I'm just trying. I mean, this discussion is going in in a wonderful direction. I just want to focus it a bit because we only have 15 minutes left now. And uh, I mean, the point point is at the end of a research project, there's usually uh, uh, more questions. That's the frustrating thing about uh, research in a way, and the exciting thing too. So. And I just wanted to focus on these questions that we probably need to tackle in order for, for future research in this field and for future collaborative research. And you already addressed a lot of the aspects. I just wanted to remind you of the questions, and this is a very old uh, presentation technology that I'm using here, um, uh, on, on the questions that we uh, addressed at the beginning of this, of this workshop. And I think we're already discussing them. The question of the requirements of interdisciplinary research in this field. So in terms of concepts, methods, uh, resources we need. And also, and that's something that I took from Julian's um, uh, talk, uh, important too, 
quality criteria for this kind of research. Yeah, uh, uh, also for for this kind of uh, uh, LC research, so to speak. What what do we need uh, to what what criteria do we need to fulfill? Um, how can we involve uh, affected uh, people and stakeholders? And important, and we saw that also in the in the last two talks and uh, in the talks yesterday. Who is uh, a stakeholder? So how how do we identify the people and the groups of people whose perspectives count? It's not only the patients; it's also the caretakers. It's also um, professional carers, doctors, and third um, and. That was what, what Silke presented, yes, or Silke and me presented yesterday. What are modes of implementation of ethical considerations in these technologies? So, how can we come away from this traditional form of LC research where we're just, as you said, running behind the technology and trying to reflect on it as an object? How can we maybe find more interesting ways also of using the technology for, for this kind of research? And now it's your turn, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you, because you mentioned thought experiment. And yesterday we had, and the day before, we had thought about a different method, more concrete than thought experiments, able to generate data. And one idea, of course, would be, OK, we have now this interesting um, analysis by Howard et al. 2021. Now, how would you set up a thought experiment that you could put in a machine that would possibly explain given the assumed technology that is has been built in these houses the reason why they had not no effect on the time or the, the uh, time of independent living we could then also extend this computerized thought experiment by saying okay and what would happen if you put in there an assistive robot with the ability that andreas hein that are, are thinking about, because I mean it's easy to simulate that, and then we could even extend this technology. It's easier to simulate that than set it up in the in the real world, because you uh, can sub uh, remove all that sensor technology. And yet, then you could even think about, okay, what would that mean with respect to data gathering? Mm -hmm. So, so we we had we would have a way to put this thought experiment into something that could generate quantitative data that would substantiate our in intuitions. Mm. Thanks a lot. Um, Stefan uh, wanted to say something already a while ago. Yeah, I, I mean, it's somehow related to, to this ongoing discussion. I mean, I was thinking about the, it's a treatment approach uh, from psychotherapy with people with depression. It's called the problem-solving treatment. So what you do is a three-step process. First of all, you, uh, you teach the patient to prioritize his or her, her problems, which is a really difficult task. <laughs> uh, the second then is to teach the patient to identify the resources which would be available uh, to solve the most important problem. And the third step then is actually to accompany the patient when he or she is actually uh, applying these resources and then eventually has to escalate uh, to a high level of resources. So it might be helpful actually to turn this around and not look so much from the perspective of technology on the problems to solve, but from the perspective of the problems on the technology to solve, which might mean, for example, that uh, like this uh, on this paper showing that it's not so helpful to use technology to keep people in their home, it might be eventually a good, uh, an alternative problem uh, to make sure that a nursing home is a better place to be in. So that this uh, um, uh, this conflict between being at home or being in a nursing home is no more such a stressor for the caregiver and the society. Yeah, I'd like to add to this because I think this was also one of our, I mean, it's not really new, so to say, within bioethics or applied ethics, but again, uh, to, to pick up the criticism that Fabrice was uh, pointing out that there's often this problem within the current way, but also funding scheme that the ethicists, so to say, have to run after the technology because technology 
perhaps not the in practice, but it's it's somehow the pace, also the the political support for developing pa faster new technologies, especially in the healthcare system, is often uh, put a priority, so to say, where then the ethicists should should check, so to say, the boxes whether this is somehow acceptable or not. But clarifying the problem question again brings me back to the second point on, on Mark's um, sheet here, namely, okay, you say, and you are working as a medical doctor, you are collaborating with a hospital, and you say, okay, perhaps we just have to make nursing home better. But what actually do people want? I think this is, for me, the main interesting point. What would be the priority list of people who have been diagnosed in a person in early stage or middle stage of dementia or any kind of other uh, disease? Would they want to stay at home and perhaps go later on into a nursing home? And this nursing home should be then still great. So, I mean, it's not like... Okay, I accept that nursing homes have a bad reputation and we, we accept that there is no money put in that system. So that's why people have to stay at home and then at the very end, okay, that's bad luck, so to say. Or do we have to prioritize both, so to say, but that would require different types of technologies, of course, because the, the, what you do in a nursing home is in a different stage, perhaps, of a, of a disease than it would be at home. And here again, I would like to point out that we have a lot of empirical studies who unfortunately say people do not only want to have better nursing homes, but people want to stay at home. So I think this is still a point we have then to take serious if we want to take serious that people, that we take first people's concerns um, a serious, second, that we are going on a problem-oriented perspective. Um, so, so I think that that is something you cannot totally, um, how to say, eliminate from the table. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there might be more sub um, informations we need because we have seen that all the reviews we have heard today, yesterday, and even before, it's the problem is still that they often analyze the current state of technology and this is somehow very frustrating let's say put it like this or and you see there's a lot of methodological um, uh, problems the studies even themselves cannot be properly um, compared um, but what is really I'm missing is a good review and I think also what people want to have and um, what they expect. And if it's true that people want to have more social care and no, not technology, I mean, that was one study imposing, then we have a real problem because none of us, but none of this in this political system does really do something about increasing the number of people who are brought into the care system. I don't see it. I don't see that there will be strong investments in having more nurses or to improve in informal care. And, and th that could be then the major criticism, perhaps. But then it's not criticizing the, tech, the engineers and the technology and the medical care, but then this criticism has to target towards politics. And that's a different group of, of agents in the system. That's at least my understanding. Thank you. Please. So on, on this point, but then the, the, the other problem is we have limited resources, right? And so you can say this is what the population, the population wants. Mm -hmm. This is their desire. But if we don't have the, the, the resources, then what do we do? So I think then again, it's another layer of complexity. Now the question is, could we fix that through technology? The article seems to indicate that you mentioned, or that Julian mentioned, seems to indicate that it's not cost effective, right? Uh, so th this is a little bit of tension. Uh, so I agree that we, if people don't want that technology or they want that technology, yeah, we should implement it and develop it. But then the question is, is cost, and then then it's a political issue, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, uh, it would be interesting to, to, to have a politician around, you know, uh, this table and, and discuss that point. Andreas and then Thomas. 
due to this complexity of the problem. I mean, uh, that's, uh, of course, a major issue. So how to have, on one hand, um, this complexity uh, in, in, in mind, on, but on the other hand side, each of our disciplines need to mm. break down the complexity to, to have a clear scientific question. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, we can do it in a way, a bit like you describe it. So we, um, so I, as a I would like to have a comprehensive review on what people with dementia really need. Mm -hmm. So in a sequential thinking, this would be the first step and you would not develop any technology until this. Mm -hmm. And a typical engineer would like to have it really clearly defined what is really wanted. Mm -hmm. And then we, I would like to start with a clear definition, a clear specification of problem what is the most optimal uh, technical solution for this problem would be nice, but in a complex world, not possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so therefore, I think it's, it's simply not possible to distinguish things and to, to do it step by step. So this is part of a complexity. And therefore, we need this very, well, how, however, uh, deeply um, connected working. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, I have no, no real idea how to, 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 to do this, or we, we try to, to do it in IDEC, but it's almost over. Um, this is one part. I think this is quite fruitful to do this. And what I first mentioned in this parallel doing. So the basis on, on this, uh, so far as I understand your philosophical discussions, so based on what the people are really are and do and like, This is a thing that is, uh, where I'm not really involved in, but this is quite important to, to do this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, this is what, what I mean with parallel. So yeah, okay, okay, okay. one thing, this is really interacting without, uh, within the disciplines, and the other thing is well, doing, well, building the fundaments of, of this. Yeah. Thanks, and the last word goes to Thomas. I think I'm simply going to reinforce what, what Andreas just just said about structuring all the whole interconnected different sets of problems that we are discussing. I mean, one, one question is exactly what would happen with respect to the time people, a person is able to stay independent at their home if we had suitable technology. Would that really change something? Yes or no? An interesting question in itself. Could be done, um, possibly not by a thought experiment, by, by something more complex, but nevertheless, it's an interesting question because this then would tell us something about is it worthwhile to go in this direction? If even perfect technology has no effect, then, then we should not invest time in developing it. The second question is that now if that technology is in place, This would not necessarily have an impact on personal interaction because this technology helps in brush, brushing teeth and not in personal interaction. But it might be interested from the viewpoint of the uh, people financing healthcare that this technology also could be used for exactly reducing the number of care workers we have. And this then might be from the viewpoint of the persons being supported by that technology undesirable and therefore they might tend to devaluate that technology because exactly of that fear, which is not, a, uh, which is not the primary effect of the technology, but rather an anticipated mm -hmm. side effect. <coughs> and all these are questions at different, different levels and somehow in order to be able to discuss this ef efficiently for setting up a new research agenda, we would probably need some time on structuring that and problem domain. And that's a wonderful uh, last word because, uh, no really, I think this is a very important discussion and I think we need to continue uh, this discussion with more time. Fortunately, uh, Andreas is not right, the IDEC project is not over just yet. <laughs> so, and I, I really think we should think about getting together one more time, using the, the time we've gained, we've won, so to speak, in next year maybe, to continue this discussion. For now, uh, I would really, really like to thank everybody here in this room, everyone out there <laughs> in, in, in the internet. <laughs> and uh, for thank you, Julian, for being with us and for your input. Uh, 
Thanks, um, very big thank you to Silke and the Göttingen team for organizing uh, this conference and to the Denhorst uh, team for hosting us and for having us. I think it was a, a very fruitful and very, very productive atmosphere here and we had really good discussions and as I said, I think we'll continue this at a later point. That was my last word. I don't know if you I want to add the very end last word. Anything <laughs> better than you did. So just thank again, especially to the HVK team, and I, we are all grateful that the technology finally worked out today. <laughs> yes, um, and we will continue. We already said we will find a date where we'll have at least um, a Zoom meeting again because we still have now. We asked all for extension of the project, and we definitely should use this because I see we are now in such a productive point. Uh, which we needed at least um, to, to grow together as an interdisciplinary collaboration. So I, I think we all took a lot of inspirations from this workshop. And I also like to thank our discussions, like Aaron and Alicia is also gone, but um, everybody else. And I hope if you are interested, just contact Julia and she will share with you the rest of the presentations when they are collected and online. Well, thanks again. Have a safe trip home. And now we have lunch. <laughs> <laughs>